Good morning. Uh, seeing that the board members are now present, Brooks, will you please call the roll to establish a quorum? Yes, good morning. Member Rodriguez. Could you hear me? Present? Already Thank now. You. Thank you so much. Uh, Member Patillo Brownson. Here and good morning. Member McQuillan. Here. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Present. Member Olkin. Present. Member Lewis. Present. Vice President Glover Woods. Here. Member Escobedo. Here. President Darling Hammond. Here. Member Banaka. Here. Everyone's present. Wonderful. I hereby call the March 2022 meeting of the State Board of Education to order at 8.31 a.m. And uh, I'd like to start by um, saluting the flag and member Glover Woods, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, I would be honored to. Good morning. Please join me as we say the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. We are now going to welcome three new board members and I will administer the oath of office to each of them. Uh, and I'm going to begin with Gabriela Orozco Gonzalez. Uh, and so uh, if you can raise your right hand, my, my hand is up, you know, with this background, it sometimes <laughs> disappears. Um, and please repeat after me. I, Gabriela. I. I, Gabriela. Orozco Gonzalez. <laughs> Orozco Gonzalez. I do solemnly swear. To solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States that I'll bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. That I will freely Oh, please repeat that part. <laughs> and that I will well and faithfully discharge. That I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I am about to enter. The duties which I'm about to enter. Wonderful. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yay. Uh, and I'm going to now move to Brenda Lewis. Brenda, if you could raise your right hand. And of course, with the background, you have to put it up close enough to be seen, right? Um, I, Brenda Lewis. Oh, you're, yes. Sorry. You're I, Brenda Lewis. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of California, and the Constitution of California, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I am well and I will well and faithfully discharge. And I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I am about to enter. The duties upon which I am about to enter. Thank you so much, Brenda. Welcome to Thank the you. board. Thank you. Uh, and next, Sharon Olkin. Sharon, please Ready? raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Sharon Olkin. I, Sharon Olkin. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. 
that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. Upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I am about to enter. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, welcome to the board. It's wonderful to have you all on board. Uh, and I'd like to ask each of the new board members if they'd like to share a few introductory comments, beginning with Sharon Olkin. You fooled me, backwards order there. I know, we do this, we go back and forth. <laughs> you don't get anybody to feel like you know, they're at the end of the alphabet and always last, so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I just first wanna say um, I'm so honored and excited to be joining this group and um, saying that oath of office really brought it home what a um, important and public duty this is. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm honored and um, I have been working on behalf of the students at Gateway for the last 20 plus years. And I've always felt like my job was both to do right by our kids and by the kids across um, all public schools more broadly, and I'm I'm really thankful to have this opportunity to um, step up in this way and to join you and learn from you all. Um, so, thank you for this honor. I'm happy to be here. And I just want to say one more thing. I'm super excited to roll up my sleeves and get to work. Um, and unfortunately, I am going to miss um, the rest of today um, because of a family funeral I need to attend. So, um, I will really roll up my sleeves tomorrow. Our hearts go with you uh, this afternoon, and we're thrilled to welcome you this morning. Thank you. Uh, Brenda. Okay, I knew with that L, there was no fooling me. I'm in the middle. Either way we go. <laughs> but first of all, good morning again to each of you. And like Sharon, I am truly excited and honored to be a member of this board and I am truly looking forward to working with each of you and other stakeholders as we just continue to make sure that we ensure a, a good academic environment in our schools for our students and an environment that supported has supportive measures for our students as well as great working environments for our teachers and for our uh, other staff members. And again, uh, my chair and I am truly just honored uh, to be able to serve at this capacity and at this level. And I look forward to working uh, with each of you. I've spent the last 33 years in education within one district, and uh, it was an honor to serve over 40,000 students. And now it's an honor to serve the millions of students and teachers and staff uh, in California. So again, I'm, I'm just grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. 6.2 million uh, children. Millions. Response yeah, that's a million. <laughs> thank Gabriella. you. Well, thank you again for this honor to be part of this board and this team. I look forward to collaborating. You know, it's been a dream of mine since I was a little girl to become a teacher. Um, from being an instructional assistant, um, working with bilingual children to becoming a teacher and just um, looking at actually different educational systems um, all over the world. I've been an um, avid traveler and, and it's always been a passion of mine and to work not only in this great state of California, but also to work in an urban school um, and school district. It really is a pleasure to, to be part of this team, to collaborate and be able to share my ideas, um, not only my personal experiences as an English language learner, but as a a teacher that has worked for over 20 years in an urban setting. So I am um, excited to also um, dive in, to learn and to collaborate and just to share my ideas and hopefully contribute um, as much as I can to, to the board and to our students. 
six million and that alone is exciting and it drives me every day so thank you so much great to have you here uh, what a wonderful start to the day uh, and so now we're going to go into closed sessions so board members please disconnect from this link go to the closed session zoom link uh, and then when we come back we'll use this link again so we'll see you in closed session uh, linda just before we depart yeah. uh, would you like to announce what we're going to discuss in closed session Oh, okay. Yes. We'll be discussing EE versus state and Carrie K versus state in closed session. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Seeing that the board members are now present, uh, Brooks, will you please call the roll to establish a quorum? Take two. We're hearing you. We're not seeing you, but we're hearing you. Now, hearing you me is all that matters. Two. Okay. Oh. Can you please call the roll? Member Banaka. Here. President Darlene Hammond. Here. Member Escobedo. Here. Vice President Glover Woods. Here. Member Lewis. Present. Member McQuillan. Here. Member Olkin. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Here. Member Patillo Brownson. Here. Member Rodriguez. Present. We have a quorum. Okay, seeing uh, in closed session, the board discussed and took action on the following legal matters, EE versus state and Kerry K versus state. Um, in terms of general announcements, uh, there is one public hearing on the agenda, item 11, Eagle Collegiate Academy, uh, which we will hold a public hearing and consider revocation of the charter pursuant to California Education Code Section 47607H. Uh, the proposed regular consent items are items 8 through 10, which will be taken up later this afternoon. The proposed waiver consent items are W1 through 8, which will be taken up tomorrow morning. Changes in the agenda include uh, taking up item four, the accountability item, after the state superintendent and the state board president's reports under item one. Uh, the state board pulled item seven from the agenda on Monday, March 7th. Tomorrow we will reopen item one to take action on the January 2022 minutes and to take up the state board liaison reports. Uh, members of the public who are wishing to call in for public comment should view the live stream of the meeting to know at what time public comment will occur for each item. Public comment may be provided by dialing the phone number and entering a participant access code uh, on a slide that we will display and then following each of the operator's prompts. Upon dialing in, the callers will be added to the caller queue. The operator will notify callers when it is their turn to provide public comment. We will also ask callers to please turn down the speaker volume of their computers if they're following the live webcast to avoid an echoing effect. Public comment will be limited to one minute per speaker. Item 13 is the general public comment item during which members of the public may provide comment on matters that are not specifically listed on the board's agenda. Board members, please mute your microphones when not speaking and keep your cameras on at all times except during the scheduled breaks or if you need to take a, a momentary break uh, to ensure that we maintain a quorum throughout today's virtual meeting. For each item on the agenda, there will be an opportunity for you to raise your hand using the Zoom participant window if you would like to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, and item one, uh, where we will start is our state board projects and priorities item. And I'll now turn it over to state superintendent, Tony Thurman uh, for his remarks. And I am looking for the state superintendent on my screen. President Darlene Hammond, we're just pulling up the cameras here for the podium. Okay, great. Thank you, President uh, Darling Hammond, uh, members of the board. Uh, good morning uh, to the new members of the board. We'd like to welcome you uh, to the board and we look forward to our work with you. Uh, uh, we'd like to share just a few notes uh, about items taking place in schools uh, and about work happening at the California Department of Education. Uh, I'll note that on last week, we helped many of our schools uh, celebrate 
um, Read Across America Day. And I'll note that uh, in this year's uh, proposed budget, the governor has made uh, programs to support literacy a priority, um, in, in particular, uh, supporting um, reading coaches and specialists, an item that we think is very important uh, to support uh, the needs of our students. I want to thank you, uh, President Darling Hammond, for your support of that item and for your work with our Reading by Third Grade Task Force, which also um, had similar uh, recommendations. Uh, it was great to be out uh, at uh, Jordan Academy and have an opportunity to read with students uh, for Read Across America Day. This is a location that uh, I've been able to visit over the last four years and all across our state. Uh, our students and our educators have been engaged in, in literacy. Uh, we intend to continue supporting it. Um, many of you know that the Department of Education this year is sponsoring a bill that would expand funding for literacy programs in the form of uh, home visiting outreach uh, to support our families. Additionally, uh, the Department of Education is supporting uh, legislation that would allocate new funding to support literacy intervention programs like the Freedom Schools program, which is a evidence-based program, an Afrocentric literacy intervention program. Uh, we're making and continuing to make literacy among our top priorities to support California students. I also want to speak on a program that's related and equally important, and that is the Community Schools Initiative. As uh, many of you remember and recall, uh, the budget has a $3 billion allocation uh, to uh, implement a community schools initiative. I want to thank uh, uh, the board for its involvement here um, and um, uh, our board liaisons, uh, President Darling Hammond and Dr. Escobedo, who've been our board liaisons on uh, community schools. Uh, and thank you for all of your great work. Uh, the request for application has gone out um, on March 1st for planning grants. These are grants that help school districts that have never had a community schools initiative uh, launch one, do the planning work to determine how to build it. Um, we're anticipating that this week, uh, a round of grant applications will go out for school districts that will be applying for implementation grants to implement um, a community schools initiative. These are for school districts that actually have experience working with community schools and so that they have an opportunity to further uh, launch their work. And shortly after, uh, we anticipate next week that there'll be another round of grant applications going out for those organizations that want to become lead technical assistance agencies to provide guidance to our school districts as it relates to community schools. So we're happy to answer questions from members of the board at any time uh, about community schools. We just wanted to give you the update that the work is moving. The legislature and the state board have made it a priority that these community schools resources get to schools as quickly as can be possible. And so we wanted to keep you uh, aware of uh, where things are with these programs. Uh, the report from our schools, uh, they're doing incredible work and we continue to uh, commend all educators, teachers and classified staff, administrators, students and parents for their resilience during these challenging times. Our schools are open and our children are learning and we're grateful for the efforts of those who are supporting them. In spite of challenges that we experience in our system, like staffing shortages, our schools are finding ways to make the most with the resources that we have. And so we commend them for their work. Uh, many of you know that um, we have launched a working group that is focused on addressing uh, staff shortages. We've had a number of, of meetings to look at the data to examine where uh, educators are going and why they're leaving. They will not surprise uh, you, um, especially given the research that our president has done over the years, that compensation and working conditions are certainly among top issues for why uh, educators leave the field at every level. Of course, these uh, departures have been exaggerated and exacerbated by the pandemic. We've just seen that in education, like in every sector, uh, many folks are leaving. Uh, but we believe that there is an opportunity to attract uh, new folks to the, to the profession and to help retain those who are in the profession and that we need a call to action to remind uh, educator candidates that this is an incredible opportunity to help young people. This state has more than $350 million in residency programs that districts can use. The state has provided $5 billion some dollars for educator effectiveness grants being administrated 
administered uh, through the Department of Education and our Triple ED division, and incredible work there. Uh, this state also makes um, uh, some uh, $500 million available in scholarships for new applicants who wish to become teachers. The resources are here. We just have to find ways to link together those resources and coordination and recruitment. There are many items in the, in the governor's proposed budget that would enhance the work of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing to support some of that recruitment, and we continue to work with organizations that are interested um, in how to recruit and retain uh, a great workforce and a diverse workforce, which is something that we continue to prioritize. I would acknowledge that on last week, the Department of Public Health uh, made a, a formal announcement about wearing masks in schools, and that as of uh, the end of this week, um, at the end of, uh, by March 11th, um, the mandate for wearing uh, masks in schools has been lifted, will have been lifted. Of course, masks can still be worn in schools. It continues to be recommended, but after this Friday, uh, our schools have been presented with information that the mandate to wear a mask uh, has been lifted. Recognizing that there's been tremendous success that has allowed us to get to this place. Californians are, are uh, highly vaccinated. Um, you know, the fact that California has used masks and other uh, uh, health protocols has allowed us to keep our schools open more than most other states. I would still urge caution uh, because we recognize that there are many communities where vaccine rates are still low and many communities where um, incidents of coronavirus infection are still high, uh, not the least of which are the African American community and in some cases Latino community and Asian American Pacific Islander communities. And uh, we should still be cautious. And so uh, for clarity for schools, the mask mandate has been lifted, but masks are still recommended um, as well as other health and safety uh, protocols uh, that can be provided for our schools. Lots of great things happening to support our schools going forward. Uh, we know that our students will recover in terms of learning gaps that they've experienced during the pandemic. Uh, universal TK programs and implementation efforts are underway. We want to acknowledge the great work of our early learning and care division uh, who are at the head of this uh, universal meals. This week they had the opportunity to celebrate um, what was the kickoff of uh, National Breakfast, School Breakfast Week, and many campaigns uh, being supported, uh, including by our first partner uh, in the state, uh, uh, to support organic meals, organic breakfast, and organic cereal. Again, want to hearken that this budget uh, that we are currently implementing provides uh, revenue to have universal meals uh, for all students, uh, two meals, regardless of a student's background. Uh, that we are implementing programs to help school districts upgrade their school facilities. And I would note some $47 million uh, for schools for uh, fresh uh, fruit and other uh, uh, organic foods. And so um, lots of things in the works to support our schools. Uh, there is a, mental, a, a children's behavioral health initiative, more than $4.3 billion to support mental health. We're working closely uh, with the departments of public health and health care services on how this uh, moves forward. Um, we've introduced at the Department of Legislation, sponsored legislation rather, that would help to fill out the pathways of those who become mental health professionals. Um, SB 1229 would provide scholarships to those who would become master's level clinicians and commit to working in communities of high need. Uh, by most accounts, California, even before the pandemic, was only able to provide about a third of uh, the need for those who needed a, a mental health professional. We know that's been exacerbated by the pandemic, by the 25 counties that have experienced fire. So we've introduced SB 1229, a bill that would fund scholarships uh, for those who would enter uh, graduate programs to become clinicians and work in schools. And we anticipate that this revenue could help to secure 10,000 new mental health clinicians for our schools over the course of the next several years. The Department of Education is currently working to uh, administer grants that can also support <clears throat> student mental health needs, including a grant to help school districts counter social isolation, uh, as well as an effort where the Department of Education will provide technical assistance to school districts to help them learn how to utilize Medi-Cal dollars to draw down uh, federal dollars to support the, the delivery of mental health programs. 
And finally, I would mention that the California Department of Education will be putting out a request for uh, proposals that focuses on uh, efforts to address bias in our schools. This is a $10 million initiative funded in last year's budget being implemented by the department to address the issues related to uh, bias and racism in our schools. There's no shortage of things happening that I believe will help to transform California schools. We like to lift these up, our community schools, our the statewide mental health initiative, our anti-bias work, uh, our work around universal TK and universal meals, and of course, expanded learning uh, to provide the types of resources to help our students um, heal from the trauma of the pandemic, uh, recover as it relates to their learning, and to thrive as we move to help them prepare for the future. And so I'm happy to share uh, these updates, Madam President. And Madam President, if you would allow me just one more opportunity, I'd like to take a moment of personal privilege to acknowledge a longtime CDE employee uh, who has now uh, joined the ranks officially of the State Board of Education. Uh, with your permission, Madam President. Please go right ahead. Thank you. I, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, Lisa Constancio, uh, a 25-year employee of the state of California who doesn't know that this is happening. But nonetheless, we want to acknowledge Lisa, who is in the, the state boardroom. I think she's trying to exit the state boardroom. And so I have to acknowledge her this way so that we do not lose her. Lisa has served at the Department of Education for 15 years until recently, and she's joined the team at the State Board of Education. We're grateful for 25 years of state service and 15 years at CDE, and that uh, as she has departed and begun her new duties in January of this year, that she's literally just gone down the hallway and still in the building, maybe still in the same parking lot, and that we still have the opportunity to work closely with her. For those of you who don't know Lisa Constancio, if I can just share a little bit about the work that she's done at the California Department of Education. Uh, she has served in many capacities since joining the department in 2006. In 2017, she became the division director uh, for our charter schools division. And I had the good fortune to work closely with her in 2019 um, when the governor appointed the task force on charter school reform, which made the first reform of charter school law in decades. And that task force came up with balanced recommendations to address many needs, and Lisa played an integral part in that work. Uh, Lisa went on to become appointed to serve as deputy superintendent at the Department of Education, working with a number of our divisions uh, that address a number of fiscal issues. And uh, in addition to that, during the pandemic, Lisa became our point person for many of the efforts to focus on uh, dealing with uh, response to emergencies and natural disasters. She became a regular member of the meetings with the Office of Emergency Services, and that work continued as the pandemic began. She became our point person who sat at many tables to make sure that resources reached our schools to, uh, to uh, counter the impacts of COVID-19. She's an incredible leader, deeply committed, incredible parent in Calif of a California students, and we are grateful to have had her service here, and we wanted to take this moment to acknowledge you, Lisa Constancio, formally for your service at the California Department of Education and congratulate you as you begin and continue your service at the State Board of Education. Please join me in congratulating and welcoming and thanking Lisa Constancio. We do have some certificates here for you, Lisa. She's declined my invitation for remarks, but um, <laughs> we would be remiss if we didn't have the opportunity to acknowledge her. Uh, Madam President and members of the board, thank you for the latitude to be able to acknowledge Lisa Constancio here today. This concludes my report. Thank you so much. And we're thrilled to uh, recognize Lisa as well. It's all in the family and we appreciate the fact that she will be continuing to serve the state from the other side of the building. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, I am going to uh, reinforce a couple of the remarks that our state superintendent has made. Uh, and as, as he uh, depicted, we're really engaged right now in a process of developing a whole child approach to education 
which includes the ways in which we think about all of the supports that children need to be ready to uh, learn uh, effectively, uh, a whole school approach to that, and a whole community approach. So it is a very important moment in the way in which California is thinking about uh, education policy. Uh, I do want to note also that next week will mark the two year the two year anniversary since the start of the pandemic in California, uh, when we all um, you know went home and um, started trying to figure out how to do distance learning. I want to thank all of the educators and families who have persevered through the most trying conditions our schools have ever faced to keep students safe and learning over these last 24 months. Uh, I want to note that compared to other big states like Florida, New York, and Texas, California has had the lowest pediatric hospitalizations, uh, the lowest death rates, the fewest school closures due to outbreaks, and that is due to the hard work of our school communities to provide our students with safe learning environments. Uh, and all of the mitigation strategies that the state, the counties, the districts, the schools together have uh, put in place uh, to allow for that kind of safety. Uh, looking ahead, the hospitalization rates are projected to decline even further, but as State Superintendent Thurman noted, there are communities where that is not the case, uh, where there are actually some increases in case rates, uh, and there are places where uh, we still have to be very, very vigilant. Um, so with new surges or variants still possible, even though the trend is downward, we have moved into this new phase, which is anchored in continued vigilance and reduced disparities in case rates. Uh, masking schools, as the state superintendent said, will be moved from uh, a required state mandate to a strongly recommended for local communities. Uh, it is strongly recommended because it is one of the best ways to protect the health and well-being of all of us, including, of course, the most vulnerable among us, uh, children who are not eligible for a vaccine, disabled people, the elderly people with com com compromised immune systems, uh, multiple chronic conditions, and in communities where case rates have not yet really begun to uh, uh, decline uh, or hospitalization rates. So as local decisions are made regarding whether to maintain or establish universal masking requirements and families are making decisions based on their own situations, it will be important for our educators to reinforce the students uh, and with parents and uh, with all of the uh, members of the school community, the importance of respecting each other's decisions. Uh, and teachers can model respect and schools can make sure that the climate and the culture of the campus is one that puts tolerance, support and consideration at the center of our policies. Uh, and of course, the best way to prevent serious illness from COVID is through vaccination. Uh, we have um, extraordinary evidence of that in the differentials that occur for hospitalization uh, or uh, death rates with respect to the differences in uh, vaccination uh, rates. Uh, and vaccines have saved lives uh, and reduced those hospitalizations. The state continues to offer mobile vaccine clinics to schools interested in improving vaccine rates. We really do need to be paying attention to this right now. And any school that wants to do so can sign up at toolkit.covid19.ca.gov, mobile vaccinations. Uh, so we wanna continue to encourage uh, an um, attitude and a support system for safety in our schools. Uh, with the end of the school and summer break fast approaching, our schools are gearing up to extend programming to students into the summer. Uh, and as the governor noted in his state of the state address yesterday, expanding access to high quality teaching and learning is key to moving past COVID and into a future where all students thrive. Uh, fortunately, California has been a leader in the US for access to before, after, and summer school programming. In fact, the uh, After School Alliance ranks California second only after only Washington, D.C. for access and quality of after school programming. And we have been expanding, will continue to expand the resources and funding uh, for that programming and for summer school programming. So with $1.8 billion in state inv investments in the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program and a total of $5 billion over the next couple of years, uh, we will soon claim that top spot and I hope we will use that time and that opportunity to really provide both the um, kinds of academic supports, everything from high intensity tutoring and other kinds of uh, academic um, 
opportunities for uh, dealing with the uh, learning recovery process that we're in, and also enrichment in music and the arts and recreation and all the other things that make a summer of joy possible for our students and a summer of learning. Uh, uh, Universal TK is also this year beginning its stage of bringing the next uh, one fourth of the students into the process of being eligible for TK. Uh, and I will say the uh, Department of Education is doing yeoman's work uh, to figure out how to give the technical assistance to districts to do this, opening up and working with the Teacher Credentialing Commission to create pathways uh, for a staff, both from early childhood and multiple subjects pathways and new uh, entrants to the field. As State Superintendent Thurman said, we have a variety of uh, supports which are open to TK, prospective TK teachers, as well as K-12 teachers in terms of Golden State scholarships, which are available to help students uh, offset their college costs by $25,000. The residency programs that are starting up, including for TK teachers, uh, the classified staff pathways that uh, enable paraprofessionals to get a pathway, a paid pathway into a teaching career. Uh, so we're uh, enthusiastic about and um, laying the table for a, a real um, growth in our teaching uh, workforce that uh, allows people to come into teaching in California without debt, with a high quality preparation, uh, and with a long-term uh, uh, possibility of committing to the field uh, because it becomes affordable in those ways. Um, I also want to just note that as uh, we look at the opportunities for both TK uh, and for expanded learning and before and after school time, uh, we are uh, launching, as the state superintendent noted, our community school strategy, which will allow many schools to tie all of these efforts together uh, and to uh, make it possible in a very um, orchestrated way to serve the needs of students in their communities. Uh, we will have the um, possibility over the next uh, couple of weeks for uh, up to uh, a couple of thousand schools in the state to get planning grants, implementation grants, uh, and we will have a technical assistance center uh, that is um, uh, responding, is, is able to be uh, conceptualized in response to the RFA that's going on. So we really wanna appreciate the engagement of the many critical interest holders in this process. Uh, we look forward to continued engagement, uh, including by our new board members. We have a lot of work to do uh, because uh, once we have um, these resources in place, implementation is the most important uh, element, uh, as they used to say uh, in the work I did in policy analysis, that implementation is the great slip between the cup and the lip if you don't uh, pay attention to it. Uh, and we are going to be paying a lot of attention to being sure that the pathway to doing this work effectively in our local schools is um, made uh, smoother by the work that we do. Uh, and with that, uh, we will dive into our work, which will uh, get us going on a number of these topics. Uh, we're going to start with item four, uh, which is the update on the implementation of the integrated local, state, and federal accountability and continuous improvement system. Uh, and the CDE is recommending that we take action related to the uh, uh, accountability work plan as deemed necessary and appropriate and that we delegate authority to CDE subject to the approval of the State Board Executive Director to pursue as expeditiously as possible a waiver to allow California to maintain its DAS modified methods business rules for calculating academic achievement and graduation indicators for um, our alternative schools um, and that we have uh, approved the submission of the 2021-22 addendum for the consolidated state plan due to COVID-19. This item will be presented by Cindy Kazanis and Joseph Science of the CDE. And Cindy and Joe, uh, please begin. Thank you, President Darlene Hammond, Cindy Kazanis of the Analysis, Measurement and Accountability Reporting Division. I wanted to welcome the new members today and also um, acknowledge that we have some new liaisons that are helping us with accountability these days, President uh, Linda Darlene Hammond and uh, Vice President uh, Glover Woods. We're uh, very excited to bring to you our annual item, our update on the implementation of the accountability system. 
Uh, some of the work that, that I do um, is to obviously lead the accountability system work, but also um, in regards to data reporting. So data that comes out of the department typically comes from my office. Uh, I have been uh, in this role since 2015 and have been uh, at the department for 19 years. So it's really excited to see some fresh faces um, here this morning. So we're going to cover a couple of uh, topics to bring you up to speed on what we've been working on for the past year and then also take you into uh, the year of work for 2022 as well as um, a couple of years beyond. I'm going to be joined by my colleague Joe Steins to discuss our uh, proposed waiver for our dashboard alternative school status uh, program as well as our addendum uh, that is um, being offered by the U.S. Department of Education that we'd like um, to take advantage of. So the recommendation, um, you can see on the screen, I'll read it once and then we'll have it at the end um, just so you're aware of the action. I know that um, President Darlene Hammond gave you a brief overview. The department is recommending that the state board take action related to the 2022 accountability work plan as deemed necessary and appropriate and that the state board of education delegate to the executive director to pursue as exp expeditiously as possible a waiver to allow California to maintain the dashboard alternative school status modified methods business rules for calculating the academic achievement and graduation rate indicators, and that the SBE approve California's submission of the 2021-2022 addendum template for the consolidated state plan due to COVID-19. So the uh, past year, um, just like in schools, um, we are seeing a lot of noise in the data, and we'd like to take you through just a couple of things that we've been working on. Uh, up to the, the release of our major data sets in January of 2022. So uh, specifically what affected our work um, was that uh, we, of course, have still been um, part of the pandemic and we've had a lot of disruptions in schools. Uh, this past uh, year, the State Board of Education applied for a waiver uh, to uh, suspend accountability requirements for the 2020-2021 school year. And what this uh, impact meant to the dashboard is we did not publish state level indicators for each of the metrics. You will see uh, local indicators though on the dashboard. Following the action um, by the US Department of Education and the approval of that waiver, we also uh, had relief from uh, state requirements around accountability uh, as, as, uh, as identified under AB 130, which was passed in July of 2021. And that um, mirrored the actions by the U.S. Department of Education in that we suspended, the state suspended the reporting of state indicators and reporting uh, available data that would have been included on the dashboard were asked to be put on our website, only if they were determined to be valid and reliable. And then as I mentioned, we were able to report out on local indicator data. So what that meant in absence of having um, values placed on it performance levels placed on our data is that we simply reported out on raw data around graduation rates, uh, our um, chronic absenteeism, as well as many other metrics. So we did release a version of the dashboard for 2021 on January 7th, 2022. You will see uh, district enrollment information, demographic information, as well as the local indicators. Of course, the local indicators um, were only for informational purposes, so you don't see a performance standard attached to it. In prior years, you would have seen met or not met or not met for two or more years. We also uh, provided the, the public transparency into the data around our graduation rates and our college career indicator. So the department has been um, su supplementing what is, what is posted to the California School Dashboard through a sister website that we host called the School Dashboard Additional Reports and Data Webpage. And on that uh, report webpage, you can get information about a school's four and five year graduation rates as we calculate it to align with uh, the accountability standards, as well as our graduation rate for alternative schools, which is a one year graduation rate. Additionally, you see metrics around our college career indicator. So while we're not able to report out on um, students who took the grade 11 assessments, we are able to report out on students who, for example, um, completed A through G and um, had um, completed the, their uh, career technical education pathways or 
uh, took a, an advanced placement um, uh, exam and, and passed it with, with a certain level. And so that additional transparency is available, again, through the, through the dashboard and on the department's webpage when you go to our accountability um, homepage. So DataQuest, um, as many of you probably know, I've already heard some data um, reported this morning, our 6.2 million kids. That's something that my division calculates and posts on an annual basis. Um, DataQuest is really the, the, the heart of um, our data reporting for, for the department around educational data. And so DataQuest continues to um, report out on, thank you, on graduation and dropout rates, discipline, absenteeism. We have a new report called Stability a stability rate, um, as well as our cumulative enrollment. That information, uh, again, was published along with the dashboard in January, and you can see comparisons between schools, districts, county, and the state. Um, additionally, there are comparisons um, for certain reports on grade spans, on whether or not they're an alternative school or not, whether or not you wanna look at it by a particular student group, so English learners, students with disabilities. Um, there's a lot of, um, uh, accessibility that is attached to these reports. And so in absence of having state indicators on the dashboard, DataQuest has been something that we've been able to maintain throughout the, the COVID-19 um, and the pandemic um, uh, phase. All right, so we're gonna move on to attachment one. I should have warned you, this is a long item. And so we will take a, a, a break for um, clarifying questions after each of the attachments. And I'll turn it over to, to the, um, to President Darling Hammond when we, when we take that break to uh, allow for those questions. So attachment one is our work plan for the year and I will get started. So we are required not only by state but federal law to restart accountability. And what does that mean in terms of knowing that we still have disruptions um, this school year in our schools? Um, students have been, um, been uh, sick due to COVID and had to stay home, and there's been a lot of concern and consternation in the field around uh, not only chronic absenteeism rates, potentially, and their effect on, on a school or district determination, but as well as um, our upcoming uh, state assessments. So while um, we, we are hearing all of this consternation from the field, we do have an obligation because we do take um, federal and state money, we have to we have to hold um, our districts and our schools accountable through the um, means that we've put forward on the dashboard and through our SSA state plan. So in terms of restarting accountability, we need to, under the U.S. Department of Education's requirement, we need to make sure that we are identifying for the first time in two years schools for comprehensive support and improvement and additional targeted support and improvement. Uh, using this uh, current school year's data. Additionally, under state law, I already mentioned Assembly Bill 130, we are um, really, um, uh, you know, we have guidance from, or rather re required under this, this provision to only use um, performance data for this current year. So we will not be looking back at old data or even last year's data to do comparisons and to create what we call a performance color. So the department is restricted from using that prior data, and so we only are able to display what we call status, or current year data on the California School Dashboard. We are recommending, and you'll hear this um, later on through the addendum, that the college career indicator not be reported because of last year's uh, 2021 statewide assessments and the um, lack of, of statewide um, uh, participation in the CASP test. Since that is a, one of the major um, pieces about how students demonstrate that they're college or career ready, um, it's really important that we have a full set of data in order to calculate that indicator. So just again, just to reiterate, the 2022 dashboard will not be able to report change <clears throat> or the difference from prior year, and we will not be performing or reporting out on performance colors due to these restrictions from Assembly Bill 130. So what does this mean? We um, are exploring options on a display. The display you see on this screen is for the English Learner Progress Indicator from the 2019 dashboard. And when the department published this information, it was um, to respond to a condition from the U.S. Department of Education. But it was also to provide transparency to the field in absence of a third year of data 
we were um, trying to, to just at least establish a baseline as to where um, schools were on this measure. So we have, a, we have a foundation about how we've done this before, but we know that it will be more than just the English learner progress indicator that will be showing status only the entire dashboard. So in thinking about um, how we would display this moving forward, we're asking our contractor, San Joaquin County Office of Education, for some mock-ups on uh, making sure that um, you know, this, this is meaningful to schools and to districts and that they can um, make, make decisions and um, also talk to the public about what this means in terms of how their schools and districts are doing. So what are the other indicators that will be reported on the dashboard using status and what data are we using um, for each of these indicators? So to begin with, the academic indicator will be using the 2022 Smarter Balance Assessments um, and California Alternative Assessments for English Language Arts, Literacy, and Mathematics. Our chronic absenteeism and our suspension rate indicators use our, excuse me, our 2021-2022 enrollment data. Our English Learner Progress indicator will use 2020-2021 and 21-22 English uh, Language Proficiency Assessments for California or LPAC results. Um, this is a, a very um, different indicator because we do need two years of data to produce status. And then finally, our graduation rate indicator will look at the class of 2020. We always look at our graduating class um, to determine this indicator. We we'll also look at students in the class of 2021 who took an additional year to um, graduate with a full, um, with a full complement of, of their um, coursework, so our fifth year graduates. And then we'll look at our dashboard alternative school students who graduated, of course, in 2022. There has been a lot of conversation in the field. I think it started maybe week two of school about the department um, taking up uh, whether or not we want to reset cut scores. And what this means is whether or not the um, status levels that were established by the board over the course of um, several meetings, if not um, half a dozen meetings, for each of these indicators, whether or not the board would take up resetting those in light of all of the, um, all of the, the, the consternation in the field, the noise in the field, the fact that we know that we have um, greater levels of students um, being absent due to the pandemic. And so we spent the last two months asking this question. We talked to the technical design group who advises the um, CDE on technical matters around the accountability system we spoke with the California Patricia's Advisory Group, who advises you, the State Board, on matters around Title I. We also talked to the Advisory Commission on Special Education. Uh, I've talked to um, several of the committees from um, the County Schools Superintendents Association. And there's, um, there's, not a clear, um, uh, there's, there's not clear guidance in the field or a clear um, desire in the field on how to proceed. But with all of these things in mind, um, we know that in our SS state plan, that we've said that we would revisit cut scores after a period of seven years. And while um, we're hitting up against seven years, we know that um, we also have two, two years in which we don't have data. And so one thing that um, we would suggest is, uh, think, let me, let me actually just go over the feedback that we received. So the technical design group um, was not in favor of the adjustments. Um, they expressed concerns that doing so may cause the system to lose credibility. We heard that again from the California Petitioners Advisory Group. Um, and I think this is important to note that they expressed concerns that lowering standards may not provide an accurate picture of what's occurring at schools. They also had um, members who expressed that if cut scores were not reset, LEAs in schools may not review the dashboard as a system that reports relevant data. So again, either ends of the spectrum on this. Um, we are recommending at this point that we keep the cut scores as is, and we continue to monitor it um, as we collect the data, and when we look next year to um, adding in change or two years of data, that we revisit this conversation. We also saw in some of the letters that you received um, from different organizations and a desire to really focus on how we communicate out about what this restart around accountability means. And so we are um, taking that recommendation and we will develop a toolkit uh, for communicating about the 2022 dashboard when it's released in December. Um, right now we have uh, several one-page flyers in the works that are relevant to 
um, the, the, the status levels, um, participation rate, um, among other things. Uh, and in years past, we've done um, some webinar slides that others can use um, that um, provide a format for them to share with, with members of the public and, and their community. And then um, we have also offered up um, key talking points. So we'll work with our educational partners um, to put these together um, as we uh, head up a release in December of 2022. So I think with that, we will shift from current year and we'll shift to things that we're continuing to work on that is a multi-year um, process around um, future dashboards. So specifically, uh, we're super excited that we had um, a little bit of time this last year to work on developing something that had been on to-do list for several years. And that was a student level data file for our college career indicator. And why this is important is because this kind of data is not available in a one-stop shop in our student, um, our student data system, CalPads, or other places. And so we um, developed internally a mechanism to create an online portal. We're calling it SOARS, the Student Online Accountability Record Status. And what this system allows to do is to share student level data back with authorized personnel from local educational agencies and charter schools. And why this is important and why there's, I think, been such a thirst from the field to understand this is uh, the College Career Indicator brings um, uh, just uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of data points together to on each individual student looking at their four or five years worth of high school and um, giving them credit for what they've accomplished, things that they've participated in. And so it's a very nice compliment um, for a school to be able to look at um, how their students were uh, able to show that they were prepared or approaching prepared on this measure. So we will be releasing this um, this spring. And again, it's only available to authorized personnel. The other thing that we've been working on uh, for several years and continue to work on, um, because you do have to ramp up on these things around um, the college career measures, is the development of two new measures for this indicator around civic engagement and industry certifications. And we know that the State Board of Education has taken action on civic engagement, and we have um, been working as a department to um, determine how best to collect that information, whether it's in our student, student level data system or in an auxiliary system that would capture students' um, information as well as um, how they potentially were um, able to demonstrate that they were they achieved um, the civic engagement um, seal. So we have met with um, the civic engagement group. They are a very civically active and engaged um, in, in a great way uh, and in collaboration with our educator excellence um, division. And I know that we have a, a meeting coming up later this summer in which we'll talk about the data collection uh, plan for, for this next uh, couple of years. Additionally, um, we have been working with our College Career Transition Division under uh, Director Pete Callis around industry certifications. And this is absolutely a multi-year process. Um, there is not a, a national standard for any of these metrics. And so California is really having to um, take a step back, look to others, how they've um, attempted to put it into something like their accountability system, how they've attempted to collect this information, again, through their student level data system. And so we are um, continuing that work in 2022 and beyond. I'm gonna switch over to assessments. And just so you know, Mal Vang is in the room in case you have any tough questions around our assessments. Um, I know she's up, up after, after me for a couple of items. We are continuing. Um, the board did take action several years back that they um, gave a nod that this California Science Test, or CAST, would be included in a future dashboard. We have been anxiously awaiting for these data to come in, for us to have two years of consecutive data. And so um, I think there's been some consternation in the field. You saw that in the letters that um, we have not been able to act sooner on including this test into the accountability system. And because the accountability system is, of course, high stakes, schools are identified for um, needs improvement and um, uh, eligibility for districts under um, differentiated assistance, it's really important that we get it right. And so we've taken um, a, a tact in which we're, we've been working very closely with our assessments division to make sure that the years of data that we would use to start um, this process um, are, are valid and, and, and reliable and we can move forward on this. 
So there is um, just a couple of things, factors that we've been um, mulling over, and the fact that we've had a limited number of students completing the assessment during um, the pandemic is a concern. The use of the revised blueprint that the State Board of Education approved back in January will be um, in, in operation this school year. There is also a need, um, as we think about bringing it into the dashboard, um, not just for informational purposes, but to actually include in an indicator, whether it's a standalone indicator or something that is um, attached to a, an academic indicator, that we need to make sure that we have the appropriate balance of academic and non-academic indicators in our accountability system under the Every Student Succeeds Act. So that is another piece of it. We will continue to update you as we make progress and as, um, of course, we have successful administrations of this new blueprint um, in the current school year. And finally, on assessments is our student growth model. Um, those of you that have um, were on the board last year, you had the pleasure of um, approving the student growth model in the, at your main meeting. Uh, we are looking forward to a couple years from now when we're going to have the necessary data sets to actually um, use the growth model uh, in the accountability system uh, and use it for, for actionable decisions at the local level. So we are going to spend, um, as we get our first years of data, full sets of data in 2022 and 2023, um, working with our contractor educational testing services to make sure that we have the appropriate um, visual displays uh, on how uh, to provide this information back to the public, because this is a very um, complex model and we need to make sure that we're communicating uh, appropriately with not only our educational partners, but with parents and community members about what this means. So we are committed to working on that over the next several years as well. Shifting gears to teacher data, and teacher data um, has, uh, has been a, a very long process for us to um, uh, bring this forward uh, for priority one. So this year you will um, see for the first time uh, the state inputting data into the dashboard for priority one. Up until now that has been um, done at the local level uh, and uh, SB 75 which was passed in 2019 um, required the, the board and the department to look at what um, data we collected at the state level that could replace the local indicators. So we are currently processing this data set uh, based on a data sharing agreement with the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. And so here's a couple of um, high-level uh, dates uh, that we think um, are feasible for us to meet around um, getting this data out. So we are in the process of um, developing a report and making sure that the, the data has met all of the necessary um, quality checks to release um, on DataQuest. Uh, that information I, will be relevant for the reporting out of this information on priority one for the 2022 dashboard. We are also committed this year to convening an ad hoc policy group to solicit feedback on how to report this data. Um, there's been questions around the definition. We will review the data elements and also talk about resources to the field because um, unfortunately, the definitions around teacher data change depending on what you're reporting on. So whether it's the dashboard, the school accountability report card, the Williams case legislation, they all have different terminology. And so we need to make sure that we are um, not confusing the field with what we are um, doing. We will update the board on our progress this fall, um, either uh, during an item or through a memo. And then finally in 2023, uh, when we have this uh, second year of data that we're able to release, we'll come back, circle back to that uh, ad hoc policy group and engage our technical experts to develop objective criteria. We need two years of data to develop objective criteria based on the standards that we use um, for putting items um, into the California School Dashboard. So my final slide in this section is around um, next year. So 2023 Dashboard and beyond, we anticipate again that we can restart our performance colors by adding in a second year of data with change and the exception will continue to be the college career indicator in which we can only report on status um, due to, again, um, not having assessment data from the prior year. For 2024, we'll bring in all of our indicators to the dashboard and report out on status change and performance colors. So with that, I'm happy to turn it over to President Darlene Hammond for any questions, um, technical questions from members of the board.
Thank you so much, uh, Cindy, not only for that really um, thorough presentation, but also for all the work you've done for many, many years to build the new accountability system that we are uh, using. You know, that really the process started uh, in some sense in 2013 with the local control funding formula. So we're almost a decade into building this and uh, your work has been extraordinary in that regard. Um, right now, I think we just want to take clarification questions and then we'll go to discussion questions later for new board members uh, and your uh, little participant um, or there's a little raise hand icon that will uh, show me if you have a clarifying question at this time. Um, and I would like to start off with one if I could while others are thinking about whether they have any. Um, Cindy, could you go uh, back to the slide which was the English learner a progress slide, which showed some designations of what was considered, um, which um, numerical rates of progress were considered to be high, medium, low. Thank you very much. And just say a little bit about how those um, were um, determined and is that um, uh, something that, um, you know, I think it'd be good for people to have clarification on where those come from. <laughs> sure, so this, this slide, um, just to again put it into context, is an example of how to report out on status only. It sounds like your question though is around how were the scores or the levels that you see on this scorecard set. So the progress determined, levels yeah. determined. So the progress levels that you see, very high, high, medium, low, very low, went through a, a rigorous um, data analysis process progress process rather by um, my division it went through our technical design group as well as the English learner um, advisory group we have a policy group that advises us on the indicator who are made up of practitioners as well as researchers and with all of those um, measures or feedback rather from those groups um, as well as the California Petitions advisory group and, and, and the, the other um, educational groups that we always reach out to um, we brought forward a recommendation um, to the state board, and the state board adopted these. Uh, what it, it, they're considered a cut scores, really. They're based on cut scores. So this is the right. status cut scores. So uh, you know, I think part part of what I've heard from other um, other groups in looking at this, uh, what we call a baseball card, this may not be very, very user friendly, and we may want to think about for this one year only doing something drastically different than we've ever done around status. Um, maybe it's creating a different um, uh, visual. Um, we lose some of the text, um, but this particular baseball card and the development of it went through, um, like I said, a, a very rigorous vetting process. The actual display of it um, had several changes um, through, through, especially that policy committee that advises us on the on the um, on the English learner progress indicator, and that's how we arrived at this particular one. The other piece I've heard just as far as feedback from the field is that um, unlike our other baseball cards, this one does not have a comparison to the state. And so this may not, um, again, may not be the best representation, but this is something that is technically currently on the website on the 2019 dashboard. Thank you, that's really helpful. And I just wanna note that, um, you know, as we were dealing with all of the challenges last year of how to get assessments done and of course, uh, some districts used our uh, Smarter Balanced CASP assessments. Others used, uh, when they could not uh, administer those, they used other assessments. We were able to get a very, very high share of our English learners assessed on our LPAC assessment. So uh, the, the data for this are much more comprehensive and complete than for uh, the other uh, tests. And I want to appreciate all the people who made that possible, both in the department and in the field uh, for that. Are there other clarifying questions? Yes, uh, Member Patil Bronson. Hey, thank you. I um, also appreciate the thoroughness of the report and also that we are creating something new in the midst of um, challenging circumstances with the, the pandemic and the effect on um, assessments. So thank you for your leadership again. Um, I was just, I wanted to actually ask uh, for a clarification. You had mentioned an ad hoc policy advisory group. Um, and if you could just talk about to what extent um, community members have been engaged, um, parents of EL children, 
um, and also of advocacy organizations um, who represent both the children and, and families. And just to clarify, you're discussing specifically around the English learner progress indicator or the accountability system? Yes. The LB, yes. Okay. So the English learner progress indicator um, work group uh, for accountability that advises the department has several representatives from LEAs, including county offices of education, who are very active in the English learner community. We do have um, researchers, uh, including um, a very um, uh, notable uh, member from, from West Ed, um, and I'm, I'm forgetting Molly's last name, but um, just you know, leaders in, in the field um, in, terms of, in terms of research, um, Magali, um, Oh, I will be able to, I, I can give you a list of those names. Um, they're actually in a board memo from several years back, so I know that they're in our board item um, because we list all of the previous board items related to our indicators. So we'll, we'll follow up with you, uh, Member Portillo. Awesome. I guess the related question to that is just, is there, or can you say more about sort of what the community engagement plan looks like going forward, particularly around cut scores and LP? Sure. I mean, I think that for, for any of our measures, um, what we're hearing from the field is an interest in looking at cut scores um, over the next couple of years. And so um, I wouldn't treat LP differently than I would treat any of the other metrics. Uh, that, that is something that the department um, you know, uh, worked diff uh, tirelessly on to, to establish. I am, I am worried. I know that um, uh, President Darlene Hammond mentioned that we've had a great participation rate for our LP this last um, cycle. And so uh, putting together this new set of data based on um, post or current pandemic um, uh, measures, it'll be, I think overall, we need to look at what a cut scores look like moving forward. But um, there is not a specific um, engagement strategy uh, per indicator. We do meet with our policy work groups um, uh, you know, on, a, on a regular basis. And so we'll go back through through that process and we'll make sure that um, through the California Patricia's Advisory Group, which members of the public do serve on and are very um, vocal about, um, about this population of students. We'll get feedback from them. And, and of course, there's obvious opportunities for public comment during that process. Great. Uh, I'm not seeing any other clarifying questions, but I do have one. Um, I believe that you said that in terms of what will show on the dashboard this year, we will not be using our color coding, but we'll be giving the status information. Is that correct? That is correct. So, it, you know, we'll, it will look different. We understand that, you know, we are very committed to growth as well as, uh, you know, growth and progress as well as status, which will not be possible for all of the indicators this year. So it will not look like our normal uh, dashboard, but it will give information. Um, Member Lewis. Just a clarifying question about, again, about status reporting as it relates to suspension rates. I think you had a slide that, you know, had all of the, the indicators on there, but I didn't see one for suspension rates. So since we didn't have any reporting on the dashboard for suspension rates since 2019, and then for this year, it's going to be status only, correct? So does that have... Does that halt uh, disproportionality uh, assignments to districts? Um, I, I cannot speak on the disproportionality assignments. That's our special education division. Um, I have turned to the slide in which um, the indicators are listed, and we did. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we okay. did group suspension with chronic absenteeism. We have been reporting out on suspension rate on DataQuest, so I want to make sure that, yes. that I say that out loud. We know that suspension rates dramatically decreased last year, the full year of COVID. And we have heard, um, you know, some some consternation about students returning to the classroom and some suspension rates going up in certain situations. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other clarifying questions? I know Cindy has more to tell us. <laughs> I don't see any other hands raised, so I think Cindy, you can proceed apace. Okay. So this is, uh, this is the quickest uh, attachment, and I won't pause for questions here because it's simply um, telling you, or rather sharing with you, uh, the amount of outreach we've been doing over the last year. And while um, my entire team of 40-plus uh, staff have been working remotely, including myself, we have gotten out to the field. 
We have held policy work group meetings, as you can see, um, we list the participant numbers, but I think really the most important one at the bottom there shows, you know, we did 26 virtual meetings with over 5,000 participants. So while accountability is suspended, there is absolutely still interest in um, engaging in uh, how schools are doing, how districts are doing, how we can better report on data at the state level absent accountability or absent a data set. And so that is um, really the work that um, we've been uh, doing in the division that I'm uh, very proud of, very proud of the team um, in light of all those obstacles. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Joe Sines, to um, introduce you to attachment three and our request for a waiver from the U.S. Department of Education. Thank you, Cindy. Good morning, President Darling Hammond, uh, Superintendent Thurman and state board members. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Joe Sines. I'm the federal policy liaison at the CDE's Government Affairs Division. And I will be reviewing the Dashboard, Dashboard Alternative School Status or DAS General Waiver. So um, just for a review on the origins of the DAS program, um, goes back to 2017. California Education Code Section 52052D allows the establishment of the DAS program. So this program is intended to ensure that California's accountability system fairly evaluates the success or progress of alternative schools that serve high-risk students. With the adoption of the dashboard in 2017, the SBE acknowledged that the system did not address the success or progress of students in alternative school settings. The SBE sub subsequently directed the CDE to develop indicators for alternative schools that evaluate the success and progress of these schools based on the LCFF state priorities and accountability requirements in ESSA. So the intent was not to develop a separate accountability system for alternative schools, but rather to include modified metrics for indicators on the California school dashboard indicators that fairly evaluate alternative schools. So as a refresher, schools are automatically assigned to DAS status because the school type is identified in education code. So this would be continuation schools, county community schools, juvenile court, et cetera, or is a district operated special education school that has at least 70% of students who participate in the California alternate assessment or CA in grades three through eight and grade 11. We know that the California alternative assessment is given to a very select number of students, but they are highly concentrated in district operated special education schools. Additionally, we provide an opportunity for schools to apply for DAS status. For this, it must be validated that at least 70% of the school population is comprised of high risk student group. So this slide gives um, a representation of uh, what it looks like and the schools that are considered DAS um, due to education code language, which we see a majority of them are. Um, approximately 835 schools or 80% of those schools are automatically assigned by school type. 39 are from the district operated special education schools and 170 schools through the DAS application process. So looking at it by the numbers, DAS students represent about 2.5% of the total number of students in California schools. 151,000 DAS students out of 6 million total students. DAS schools represent about 10% of the total number of schools. So 1,044 out of about 10,000 total schools. This is significant for our accountability system. We have over 1,000 DAS schools, which far exceeds any other state in the nation. And the number of students served in this alternative setting is also uh, much more than any other state. So DAS schools receive performance colors on every state indicator. However, to fairly hold DAS schools accountable, we identified three indicators where we could implement modified methods. Specifically, these were the graduation rate indicator, the college career indicator, and the academic indicator. Um, so just, you know, I know uh, it's hard to even remember 2020, much less 2017. So for further background, we can take a look at the timeline of the DAS program. 
2017 was when the State Board requested the development of the DAS program and the work that went into this program was robust and done in partnership with the alternative school community. There was a lot of work with CPAG, the State Board, the Alternative Schools Task Force, and other interest groups to develop and vet these proposals. In 2018, the CDE was able to bring before the State Board to approve the use of modified methods of state indicators for DAS schools. In 2020, California received a letter from ED stating that the use of modified methods to calculate state indicators for DAS schools is not permissible. Specifically, the following is prohibited. Establishing different cut scores for DAS schools for the academic indicator and using a one-year graduation rate, which our modified method is. And so for the continued timeline in 2020, December of 2020 to be exact, CPAG received an update on the letter from ED, ED and CDE staff received feedback on the modified measures for DAS schools. Also, the State Board received an information memorandum on the letter from ED. Following that, in January 2021, the SBE approved amendments to California's S estate plan to bring the DAS modified methods business rules for calculating the academic achievement indicator into compliance with federal law. Oops. Okay. However, in January 2022, we received two letters from ED in response to California's S estate plan amendments. In February, the SBE received a memo with a copy of the responses from ED. All right. So in the letter from ED, they specifically stated that CDE's modified methods do not meet the ESSA requirements. They stated that ESSA only allows the use of alternative, alternative accountability metrics for schools missing the data required for accountability determinations. In this letter, they specifically called out preschool through second grade schools. They did this since these schools are unable to have an academic indicator since they do not test in these grade levels and therefore an alternative accountability metric is permitted. However, they do not approve this for schools that do, not, that do have the necessary data to receive an accountability determination. So this would be DAS schools that test students. Therefore, we cannot substitute an accountability metric. So uh, this slide takes a look at what the denial of these amendments have, the impact of the denial of these amendments have. We would no longer be able to use the one-year graduation rate. We would instead have to use the four-year cohort rate. Additionally, DAS schools will be head to the, held to the same cut scores for the academic indicator on the five by five performance level grid as non-DAS schools. And so this would begin immediately with the 2022 dashboard that is due to be, be released this fall. So there is an option to request a waiver of ESSA statute, which we are discussing today. This has been done in the past. This would potentially allow us to keep the current system in place and would allow for modified measures for DAS schools through the DAS one-year graduation rate under the graduation rate indicator. Um, different five by five cut scores for DAS schools and for the academic indicator, different five by five cut scores for DAS schools as well. Now we'll walk through additional considerations that ED provided in their response letter to the CDE on the DAS amendments. Specifically, two of the ways they suggested using to reduce the impact of identification of DAS schools being over-identified for support were partial attendance modifications to dashboard indicators and also to modify how we assist schools for support. For partial attendance, we could look at excluding students who have not attended the same school within an LEA for at least half, a, half of a school year. For school support eligibility, we could change the identification pool for the lowest performing 5% of Title I schools from all schools to, identif to identification school type. So this would be elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and DAS schools. Additionally, while the CDE is waiting for action from ED on the waiver, the CDE ex is exploring options to continue to include the modified measures for the graduation rate on the dashboard for informational purposes. This may include other yet to be determined measures. 
We can also develop a new report that displays an additional DAS color placement designation on the school dashboard, additional reports, five by five placement report. And finally, the CDE is considering the development of a new report that displays the DAS school's distance from standard without the, partic without the participation rate penalty. So we have received, um, we currently do have um, public comment open for this uh, potential waiver. It's open through March 30th, 2022. As of March 8th, 2022, we received 15 comments which were all supportive of pursuing the waiver. Also at the February 2022 meeting uh, for the California Practitioners Advisory Group or CPAG, the members did express support for pursuing a DAS general waiver. So now I will pass it back to President Darling Hammond and the state board members. All right, thank you so much. Uh, are there any clarifying questions for Joseph? I am not seeing any yet. Give it a minute of wait time. You were exceptionally clear. <laughs> So I think we're passing the ball back to Cindy, is that correct? Uh, no, I'll be handling attachment four as well. Okay, uh, then carry on. All right, we are almost to the finish line. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> uh, our next attachment, attachment four, will be California's 2021-22 addendum template for the consolidated state plan due to COVID-19. So uh, we'll start off uh, for some vital background on the prior federal COVID-19 waivers. As you know, um, the past couple of years, we have dealt with this um, in each year. So I think it's important to have a little bit of background for our new members and uh, draw a line of how we got to where we are today. The first assessment and accountability waiver we will look at will be the 2019-20 waiver California submitted. Due to the extraordinary circumstances created by the COVID-19 pandemic and resulting school closures, the U.S. Department of Education invited states to request a waiver for the 2019-20 school year of the assessment requirements. Through this waiver, states would not need to administer statewide assessments to all students to make annual accountability determinations to identify schools for support and improvement or to provide data on its state and local report cards for assessment and accountability information. Our waiver was supported by, or submitted by uh, State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman, and California State Board of Education President, Linda Darling-Hammond on March 26, 2020, and was approved quickly by ED on March 27, 2020. For reference, this slide also lists the ESSA sections that were requested to be waived and subsequently approved. Now that brings us to the next assessment and accountability waiver. For the 2021 school year, ED offered the COVID-19 state plan addendum to allow states to modify their accountability systems described in their state plans to account for the lack of data due to the assessment and accountability waivers from the 2019-20 school year. This waiver was brought before the SBE and approved for submission to ED requesting that the following requirements be waived. This was the removal of the 95% participation rate penalty for the academic indicator, removal of the requirement to identify schools for support based on 2020-21 data, requirement for schools that are currently identified to support to continue to receive support in the 21-22 school year. This allowed states to exit comprehensive support and improvement or CSI schools based on the graduation rate if exit criteria are met, and this required states to resume identification of schools based on the 21-22 data. So now we get to the current 21-22 addendum template. In December of 2021, the ED released the 2021-22 addendum template for the consolidated state plan due to COVID-19 to provide states a streamlined process to modify state plans for only the 2021-22 school year as they implement accountability and school identification requirements. Now it is important to note that any changes that would be go beyond the 2021-22 school year would require the CDE to use the regular state plan amendment process. And this is noted in the template as well.
So the CDE proposes amending the state plan by shifting forward timelines two years for measurements of interim progress and long-term goals, modifying the school quality indicator, and for schools eligible for assist assistance, this would be change in identification frequency, change in methodology, and revising the entrance and exit criteria. And now I have the pleasure of passing the presentation back to Cindy. Thanks, Joe. So just to note, I know that um, Joe mentioned that this uh, addendum is only for the, the current school year and just I think for our new members and maybe for some of our older members, uh, these addendums are unprecedented. Um, doing a streamlined waiver and getting a response back from the US Department of Education in 24 hours or a week is, is simply, that doesn't happen. And I, I do have to acknowledge um, that they have been extremely responsive to the COVID-19 situation uh, by preparing um, things like an addendum template. Um, this is the third year in a row that they've done it and it has um, really relieved um, the departments or state departments of education from having these onerous requirements um, placed on schools and districts when we know that they should be other places. So the Department of Education is recommending, and we did um, receive feedback we're going to do later on in the California Teachers Advisory Group, that we um, take advantage of the opportunity to shift forward our long-term goals by two years. This is in keeping with um, the fact that we've actually lost two years in our accountability system uh, to uh, demonstrate uh, that we are meeting long-term goals or are on our way for the measurements of interim progress which are reported out um, through the dashboard and uh, on our state and uh, OEA report cards. And so we want to make sure that we're treating every indicator the same. And so you do see um, our recommendation that we um, shift the, the, the two-year, or rather shift um, these um, timelines two years for the academic achieve, achievement, graduation rate, and the progress in achieving English language proficiency. proficiency. So the second uh, piece that we want to um, also recommend to the board to take advantage of is the modification of the school quality indicator. And in California, um, we use two, two indicators to measure this, suspension rate and college career indicator. As we were thinking about uh, this uh, particular indicator and what is uh, you know, a challenge for us, you've already heard on reporting out on the college career indicator data, we did reach out to the US Department of Education and had a phone call with them to talk through um, if we were not able to report out on this, um, would they be amenable to uh, including this in our addendum? And because we used two indicators to measure school quality, they said, absolutely, this is something that um, the addendum was, was designed for. So we are, again, recommending removal of reporting out on the college career indicator um, for the 2022 dashboard due to limitations of that grade 11 assessment um, from this past administration, from the 2021 administration. We will, of course, as you heard earlier, continue to use suspension rate and report out on that for all grade levels to meet the requirements in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. The third piece is probably the one that is um, one of the more difficult ones. Um, we are required to identify schools for the first time in two years. I've just mentioned that in the, the prior attachment. So um, the identification process falls into two different categories, comprehensive support and improvement and additional targeted support and improvement. And these determinations will be made based on using data from the 2022 dashboard. As you heard in the previous attachment, we are per, per, uh, prohibited from reporting out on um, additional years of data on the dashboard due to the constraints from Assembly Bill 130. And so uh, this one-time change in the addendum, um, we are uh, gonna be suggesting uh, over the next couple of slides, uh, several uh, one-time changes that would affect uh, the material for the, for, the 20, for the 2022 identification cycle. So the first piece is the change in methodology. Uh, we have our current state plan that is approved by the US Department of Education uh, shows uh, uh, rather, let me, let me take a step back. Um, we are going back to using our English Learner Progress Indicator as an example of, um, of how we'd like to change the methodology by using status only for identification purposes. We, we were in this situation back in 2019 because there was the condition, 
a condition placed on us by the U.S. Department of Education to utilize the LP2 um, identify schools. And so we used a proxy of very low uh, for our red performance categories. We did that based on data analysis and simulations, trying to see, trying to make sure there wasn't um, a lot of noise in the data and that we were identifying the right, um, right types of schools, again, based on this proxy. We found in that um, simulation process back in 2018-19 that if we used other status levels, uh, for example, low as a proxy for orange, that we introduced um, air or the, the, the correlation um, didn't tend to be as strong. In November of 2019, the state board approved the recommendation to use this in the methodology and we, um, we were able to identify schools um, using the English learner progress um, indicator as part of the methodology. So we are suggesting that we take the lessons learned from this one indicator and apply it to the entire dashboard. We, we have done additional simulations. Now that the, when the addendum came out, we, we met internally, we thought about how we could bring forward um, uh, this item to you and make sure that it was based on um, a recommendation that was, tech, um, that was valid and reliable and tech, technically sound. And so this, um, this, this, uh, these simulations have been run by our technical design group as well as the various um, policy groups that I've mentioned um, previously. What we found is very low is, um, I know we use the word decent, but it is an appropriate proxy for, for red. We did um, confirm with this new uh, simulations that we conducted that low, medium, and high, and so the corresponding colors would be orange, yellow, and green, are not suitable proxies um, for the color because of the increased level of air. And you can see that in the data that we, I show um, below on this slide. So you can see at either ends of the spectrum, very low and red and very high and blue, there's a high correlation. But as soon as you get into um, orange and yellow and green, um, there's just a, a, you know, a, a much higher level of, of air that is introduced because you're bringing change into the situation. It has more of an impact. So in thinking about how to shift eligibility criteria, again, for this one year only, we went back and we looked at what our current eligibility criteria was in our SS state plan. That is what you see on this screen, but we've made some edits to it. So the suggestion that we started with was, let's simply cross out anywhere that it said um, a color and substitute it for the corresponding status level. Um, we know that each of these criteria, I should say, that you saw that they, they, they all introduce air, some of them higher than, than others, um, because status is, is not in a direct correlation or proxy for color. And in looking at this list, um, we, we, I should actually just take a step back. When we uh, look at schools for comprehensive support and improvement, the first category we need to look for is any school that has a graduation rate less than 68%. We take those out of the pool, they are identified. We then look at Title I schools. So Title I schools who meet the criteria below, and this is done in the hierarchical um, uh, method. So the requirement for the low performing, comprehensive support and improvement identification is that we identify 5%, not not rounding up to 5%, but at least 5% of schools in the state. And so the uh, simulations uh, results that you see below on this slide were we used the status, status criteria from the 2019 dashboard. We applied this methodology, so using a proxy of very low um, for red. And the, uh, the descriptions that you see, so this is, this is referring to each of the indicators. So if I'm a, a school with, um, uh, a high school rather, you may not have as many indicators um, as an elementary school may. And so that's why these, these categories are all very low, all very low except one, majority and very low. So that's each of the indicators um, together um, create these descriptions. So to, just, to walk you through what, what this slide is trying to tell us is that for um, all very low, if we were to use the 2019 data, we would see 163 um, schools 
being eligible, um, Title I schools being eligible for assistance. That equals 2.4% of our Title I schools, again, minus those that had already been identified for graduation rate, low graduation rate. We bring in the second criteria, we go, this is um, moving cumulatively, we get up to 4.9%. Keep in mind, we, get, we have to get over 5%, so we need to bring in at least that third criteria. We'd come up to 7%. If we brought in the fourth criteria, we'd be up to 11%. So well above and beyond the requirements of the Every Student Succeeds Act um, for California. So with that in mind, um, the, the two status criteria of all very low and all very low except for one gets us to 4.9%. And my staff tell me that's eight schools short of 5%. We know that life has changed dramatically in our schools since 2019. And there is a high likelihood that we will be able to only have to use those first two criteria to meet the 5% threshold. But just in case we don't, we wanna make sure that we have um, a backup plan. And so um, this is another uh, look at the data. This is um, simply giving you a, a bit of uh, context for those of you that I know President Darling Hammond likes, likes to look at data, look at the air that is introduced. Um, so we looked at um, the 2019 data, and if, if we are using the status levels instead of color, we're actually identifying 64 more schools using this methodology, 135 um, using the first two methodologies, and so on. And so just um, another look at um, you know, the fact that it's not a perfect correlation of proxy um, between red and very low. So the recommendation is um, from the department that we use criteria one and two and if um, we don't meet that 5%, we incorporate criteria three. So you see those criteria in the addendum, the first three criteria. We don't believe we need criteria four because based on, again, our simulations, we know we're gonna get to 5% just with those first three criteria. And with that, I think to turn it back over to Joe to close this out. Okay, and um, just to review our feedback on this um, from interest groups, at the February 2022 CPAG member meeting, the members expressed support uh, for our proposal to submit the 2021-22 addendum template. And so uh, finishing off our recommendations, the California Department of Education recommends that the State Board of Education take action related to the 2022 accountability work plan as being necessary and appropriate that the SBE delegate to the SBE executive director to pursue as expeditiously as possible a waiver to allow California to maintain DAS modified methods business rules for calculating the academic achievement and graduation rate indicators, and that the SBE approve California's submission of the 2021-22 addendum template for the consolidated state plan due to COVID-19. Simple enough. <laughs> Uh, how simple on a scale of one to 10. <laughs> <laughs> so um, before we get into uh, public comment uh, or discussion, I want to just be sure that if there are clarifying questions uh, on the um, last portion of the presentation, we take those. And it is complicated. Uh, I do have one clarifying question myself um, that I'd like to ask and if others do, and then we will go into fuller discussion of everything. Um, so, uh, Cindy, you did a good job of explaining to us, you know, how we need to reach a, a five percentage of Title I schools need to be identified for um, uh, support and intervention. Um, and, of course, uh, you know, we've always done that in the past with uh, growth and progress, uh, progress and status being considered. Obviously, this is not our... Um, is not the approach we would have chosen. It's the approach that you know meets the federal requirement for this year. Um, you start off mentioning the high schools who uh, have less than a 68% graduation rate. Uh, when you identify those, uh, do they count into the 5%? And uh, maybe you could help us understand the relationship between the two sets of calculations, the high school calculation, and then of course, um, you know, the identification of other schools who are rated very low on the status indicator. 
A absolutely. And in fact, uh, I wish I had a graphic because I, I, I do think <laughs> this is... This There's is a Venn diagram in there somewhere, yeah, I think. This is, this is not intuitive. Um, so the first uh, step when you look at identification for comprehensive support and improvement is to look at all high schools in the state and see if they fall be below that 68 uh, percent. If they do, they're automatically in and they're taken out of the pool of schools. We then shrink the pool of schools to just Title I schools, which was, uh, I just want to go back to my numbers, which is 6,852 for 2019. So that ends at that end at the top of this um, last column here. So the 5% is based on schools that are in the pool after we've removed the low graduation rate that are Title I. So we need to do 5% of 6,852, and that calculation uh, is 343 schools. You can see on the second um, full bullet on this slide. That was again for, for 2009. Yeah, so the high schools that are identified are in addition to, I mean, they're, they're sitting over there as a separate group. Correct. Um, they're sort of skimmed off remote. the top. That's how I would put it. That you skim them off the top, and then you 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 have a small a shrunken pool that you you start with for the five percent. Gotcha. And those high schools come from not only Title One high schools, but any high schools in the state. Correct. Any high school in the state that has a a, a graduation rate lower than sixty eight percent, regardless of funding status, would be identified. So I just wanted to be sure everybody kind of understood what we we're going for. And if I understood you correctly, you think that probably when we do the, this is based on simulations, but when we do the analysis, uh, it may very well be that we only use uh, criteria one and two. We, yes, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't predict the data. I, I gave up on that um, after we had the first year of COVID. Uh, but I, it, it does seem like um, because we were so close in 2019, that we will probably get to that with the first two criteria. And then my last question, which uh, could lead us, you know, I don't want to go too far into discussion because we want to get public comment, but if we did have to go to criteria three, uh, are we anticipating any way of um, slicing that so that we don't have to add another whatever, two, 300 schools, uh, 400 schools to the, uh, to the mix? Yes, so I've, I've changed um, the slide, so you, we, I've gone back to that simulation that we did, mm -hmm. and uh, right. we, did, you know, we did add in, what, roughly 150 more schools with the simulation. Uh, we can't stop at 5%. We have to apply that metric universally. That was one of the conditions that we negotiated with the U.S. Department of Education. Um, actually, in person, I was there in Washington, D.C. several years back. So. It, it, it is unfortunate because it does bring us up well over the 5% based on these simulations. Um, but it, you can see there that, um, like I, I think we feel pretty confident about the criteria one and two, maybe the only ones we need to apply so we can get closer to that 5% of schools. Okay, thank you. I don't want to uh, belabor that now. Are there any other clarification questions? I am not seeing any hands coming up, so with that, we want to encourage folks to queue up for public comment. Um, we are going to uh, ask our liaisons for any comment they want to make. Uh, then we're gonna take a few minutes break because there's a technology concern for getting the public comment line open. Uh, so you'll have a moment to you know, take a, uh, get a quick cup of coffee or whatever, and then we'll come back. So just to give you a little foreshadowing. And while uh, if you are interested in uh, providing comment on this item, you can call the telephone number and use the access code shown on this slide. Uh, and your comments will be limited to one, per one minute. And we want to remind you when you do call in to turn down the volume of your computer uh, on the live webcast to avoid background echoes. Um, and so with that, um, I'm going to ask um, our uh, liaison, Vice President Glover Woods, if she'd like to make a comment, and then I will make one, and then we will take a little break. Thank you very much. Just a couple of very uh, brief comments, but first, just an uh, expression of gratitude to Cindy, Joe, and the CDE staff for working with this. Um, again, 
not simple at all as we try to ensure that our accountability system uh, continues to be reflective of what was um, needed um, in the midst of all of the changes that have happened. So thank you so very much for all of the work and the timeless hours that have gone into the, to um, sharing what you've shared with us in this item today. Um, just a couple of points I'd like to make um, before we move forward. And one is just to underscore how important it is that we do indeed restart our accountability system um, to ensure that all of our LEA schools and students are receiving the support that they need. Um, in that same vein, it's also important that our restart respond to what we know has taken place in our assessment actions over the last couple of years. So um, the communication toolkit that was referenced a little earlier in the presentation is going to be very, very key so that our community understands how we're reflecting the data um, as a result of not using our performance level colors and really reflecting the status change in the upcoming dashboard, as well as providing the support that LEAs will need to communicate this information to not only their governing boards, but their communities and families as well. Uh, so um, thank you for that and looking forward to just ongoing work to make sure that things are crystal clear and um, that as we move forward with representing the status only information on the dashboard that it's done in such a way, of course, that does not confuse people with the way we've represented our performance level colors uh, when we do indeed have data um, with status and change. The other um, couple of points that I wanted to bring forward is that um, very excited and encouraged by the future plans and next steps that Cindy outlined in the presentation. I think it will just help for us to enhance the support that we provide to students by enhancing the level of data that we will receive. And um, just to continue to underscore how important it is to be in collaboration with our educational partners in the development of those next steps. The uh, pursuance of the waiver uh, for the DOS schools is critical, again, not to rehash, but we've already heard of the support that is there, knowing that the methodology that was developed for our DOS schools was done so thoughtfully to be reflective of what we feel was necessary in reflecting the data for students in California that attend those schools. And so uh, just uh, quite excited that we will continue to pursue a waiver for that as well as the other flexibilities that will be outlined in our 21-22 addendum. So again, just in closing of my comments, President Darling Hammond and, and uh, members, fellow members of the board, um, a restart is critical and it's time for us to continue to move forward with this robust accountability system to be sure that our schools receive the supports that they need um, also as critical in the restart is how we restart to be sure that our LEAs have the data necessary to make the plans that uh, will be so critical in supporting our students moving forward. So thank you very much, President Darling Hammond, for a moment just to speak to this item. Yeah, thank you. And I'll just add on a couple of thoughts. Uh, again, I wanna uh, underscore how much work has gone on by the uh, members of our leadership in the State Board of, State Department of Education and the previous board and this board in building this accountability system uh, to really represent more indicators of how kids are doing and what kinds of support they're getting. Um, and uh, that is a really important um, a foundation for what we will want to be doing uh, next. The uh, momentary um, need to identify schools uh, only on the basis of status uh, is, as uh, you all no doubt know, uh, really at odds with the philosophy and the approach that the board has adopted in California, which is that uh, your school uh, employees are always trying to, um, whatever students come to school with, enable them to make substantial progress. The recognition of that progress has been at the core of California's effort, by the way, we were one of the first states to do that. Other states have uh, since you know, uh, taken uh, a page from, from our book. So uh, we uh, have discussed the fact that you know, the frame in California now is not one of 
shame and blame or um, you know pointing fingers at schools that are serving uh, high need students in, a, in an era of high need. Um, that this really is about uh, support and improvement, about getting resources uh, from the SIG grants you know, to the schools that uh, demonstrate the greatest needs and to do that in a way that acknowledges the uh, efforts that educators have been making all across the state to meet the needs of their students and to meet the needs of the times. And I know that um, the, uh, my colleagues in the Department of Education uh, completely agree with that framing and that is how the framing will be communicated uh, to the field when those identifications are made. It is important in some respects to uh, try to get that 5% uh, line that is required by the federal government uh, as close as possible to that number so that we are giving as much support as we can to schools to make it practicable for them to do some really uh, thoughtful um, improvement steps uh, in the next uh, coming years. So uh, the final point that um, Vice President Glover Woods has made is that this is a moment not only to restart, but also to rethink. The Department of Education has uh, issued um, some uh, guidance, which invites states to think about how to uh, configure indicators in their accountability systems that take account of opportunity to learn uh, about what kids are experiencing, as well as how they're doing on multiple measures. We've already gone further down that path than many other states, uh, but we will want to take advantage of that invitation to think together with our uh, leadership in the department about where does California wanna be um, in the next decade, um, having built on what we started a decade ago. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm told that um, the folks who've called in for public comment can stay on the line. But there is a need for a brief break because of a technology need to uh, establish the call in line in the right way. And now I have said everything that I understand. I'm at the edge of my technological competence. So we're going to take a break for about five minutes. It is 11.09. Uh, let's try to be back at 11, let's say 15. We'll give ourselves six minutes for that technology need to be met. And we'll see you then. Do not leave the meeting. Just turn off your video and your um, microphone.
All right, thank you. Um, we are now looking for public comment. I understand there are callers in the queue. There are, Linda, just before we do that, would you like me to reestablish our quorum? Yes, please do that. Sorry, I know we're a little bit out of order today with our technology issues. Yeah. <laughs> Member Rodriguez. Present. Member Patillo Brownson. Here. Member McQuillan. Here. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Present. Member Olkin. Member Lewis. Present. Vice President Glover Woods. Here. Member Escobedo. Here. President Darlene Hemd. Here. Member Bananca. Here. Member Quorum. All right. Uh, we are ready for public comment. Please uh, state your name and affiliation for the record. Remember to turn down the speaker volume of your computer if you're following the live feed. Speakers are limited to one minute each. Okay, it looks like we have 12 people signed up in the queue for public comment. Again, this is for public comment for item number four. I will open the phone line now. Good morning, State Board of Education. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute, your time starts now. Hello, this is Shilpa Ram from Public Advocates. We have two requests of the State Board relative to the Priority One Teacher Quality Indicator. First, Public Advocates ask that the State Board direct CDE to include a more robust Priority One Indicator in the Dashboard Work Plan. To align with Ed Code, that more robust indicator needs to be based on teachers who are both fully credentialed and properly assigned, and not only on the relatively few teachers who are misassigned as Item 7 had proposed. The agenda item in today's presentation did not include the need to make the priority one indicator more robust, and it's important that that happen. Second, we appreciate the proposal in today's presentation to include educational partners in the work to establish objective criteria for priority one and conclude the work next year. Thank you for ensuring that the dashboard work plan include a stronger commitment to full implementation of priority one. Thank you. Good morning, State Board of Education. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. This is Suzanne Cui of the Charter Schools Development Center. Good morning, board members. CSCC strongly encourages the state board to aggressively pursue the preservation of modified metrics for DAS schools to fairly and appropriately evaluate a DAS school's impact on their students, as attachment three states. Fair and appropriate evaluation of schools' impact on students should be a primary focus of our data and accountability system, but we have multiple issues at the school level. In addition to DAS methods, the federal department rejected the CDE's formulas for the English Learner Progress Indicator and the CDE's Participation Rate Penalty. The CDE versions more accurately reflected student performance. The new federal participation rate penalty will tank the academic indicators, for example, when small student groups are affected. The state does not have to use the federal version for state purposes including charter you renewal. Your time is up. In fall 2023, it will be more than shame and blame. It will mean uh, school closure based on imperfect data. So I hope we can address that. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Good morning, State Board of Education. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. Hi, my name is Shay Fairchild and I've been a teacher for the past 16 years with my current assignment as a teacher on special assignments to implement and train um, TK through 12 teachers in science. Additionally, I just completed my four year term as a member of the Instructional Quality Commission, an experience that has profoundly changed my educational career. Through that experience, I have learned that we are partners, CDE, State Board of Ed, and districts. And without um, your support, we cannot do our job with full fidelity. Let me explain the issue. In my district, I have been given 30 minutes with elementary school teachers and approximately 11 release days for secondary teachers in the past four years pre-pandemic for the implementation and the instructional shifts required uh, for the change in NGSS. And for many districts, we are further ahead. This is where you guys come in and the voice for equity and access. Our students um, in the state of California, they Thank must- Thank you, Paula, your time literate. is up. Thank you, caller. Good morning, State Board of Education. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. 
Good morning, Dr. Darla Hammond and board members. Diana Vu on behalf of the Association of California School Administrators. Access concern that a dashboard that is limited to only status will display an incomplete picture of the performance of LEAs in each indicator. To mitigate for the lack of change in performance level colors, access requests the following. One, imitation on this 2022 dashboard that acknowledges that COVID-19 pandemic abruptly disrupted education. The narrative should also include, should also explain why the dashboard is only displaying status reports. Two, the CD's communication plan and toolkit for LEAs include helping explain the anomalies captured within the 2022 dashboard to parents in the community. Three, a narrative text box accompanying each state indicator that enables LEAs to narrate their unique challenges and gain, gains during this, this unprecedented time. Lastly, Access strongly supports a waiver request to the U.S. Department of Education to continue the use of, of, of alternative metrics within our state county systems for DAS schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Good morning. This is Christina Salazar with Californians Together. We would like to highlight the need to revisit the definition of English learners for the academic indicators by defining the EL subgroups as current EL's only to make visible the need to address these students in their classrooms now in, and in the LCAP. Using the data file supplied by the department with the current status criteria, only 98 schools would be identified by the EL subgroup. This is less than 10% of all the schools in California with 30 or more English learners. Although not part of the federal addendum, only two districts would be identified by the differentiated assistance for the English learner subgroup. This is not a new issue as we have brought this up in the past three years, but so would greatly appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. Good morning and welcome new board members. My name is Jessica Sacco. I'm calling in on behalf of Children Now. Since districts focus on dashboard indicators, we encourage that the board start to add science to the dashboard starting with reporting performance in 2023 and then adopt a 5x5 five five color matrix in 2024. Furthermore, we encourage the board to start now to model ways to incorporate the growth model into the dashboard because we believe it is the single best measure of school quality. We support seeking the federal waiver for alternative schools and think that additional work is needed to strengthen accountability for these schools. For the 2022 dashboard, please allow easy access to the full scope of teacher data available, including teacher assignment ineffective and out of field teachers broken down by student group. And finally, specifics are included in the LCFF Equity Coalition and Alliance for Student Success Letters on all of these topics and more. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. Good morning, Dr. Darling Hammond and members. This is Derek Lennox on behalf of the California County Superintendents Educational Services Association. We support the CDE's proposal to pursue a waiver to allow California to maintain dashboard alternative school status, uh, modified methods business rules. As DAS schools serve some of California's most vulnerable and transient students, we are concerned that the changes to the current modified methods could portray an inaccurate picture of our DAS school students' outcomes as well as uh, result in an over-identification of DAS schools for comprehensive support and improvement. So we applaud and thank the CDE and State Board for your ongoing commitment to equity and for ensuring that each of our 6 million students are fairly represented in our statewide ac accountability system. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. I'm Peter Ahern from the California Association of Science Educators. I want to thank President Darling Hammond for reiterating the board's commitment to having science on the dashboard at the last SBE meeting. We thank CDE for clarifying the conditions for putting science on the dashboard. CDE points out that NGSS implementation is stalled and suggested that this might be a reason to delay putting science on the dashboard. In fact, it's the other way around. Districts are told to use the dashboard to inform their LCAP. So when they don't see science on the dashboard, they don't fund NGSS implementation. Science is likely to be on the dashboard after testing in 2023, given CDE's timeline. Districts need to plan for this. Indicating science as a status-only indicator or creating a placeholder indicating that science is coming would do a great deal in signaling districts to fund science implementation. In addition, we also ask the board to please support Assembly Bill 2565, author Rubio, which would finally help fund long-term teacher leadership capacity and professional development for engineers. Thank you, Caller. Your time is up. 
Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. Good evening, members of the State Board of Education. This is Manuel Bonrostro with California Together, and we support uh, the recommendations in the LCSF Equity Coalition letter. Uh, specifically for this, I, I am calling to highlight our concerns with the low expectations that the current LP cut scores set for districts. The current cut scores would rate districts as very high, even when over one in three of their English learners do not make progress. This leaves complacency in the system. Moreover, based on the 2019 data, only 20 school districts were identified as very low, enrolling less than 1% of all English learners. In a true equity-focused system, we would want expectations to be set based on what we want to see in the system, not based on the previously inequitable outcomes of the past. This is why we continue to ask the State Board of Education and the Department to revisit the LP cut scores and that it be included in the addendum template. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. Hi, uh, my name is Leticia Garcia on behalf of the Riverside County Superintendent of Schools. We support staff's request to pursue a waiver to maintain the DAS modified metrics for calculating the academic achievement and graduation rate indicators. We believe the DAS program is a balance between high accountability for alternative schools and an opportunity to be successful. This modification is critical because our students come to us at various stages of their academic career. We service our students within the framework of MTSS, promoting the whole child approach, which means restorative practices, ensuring literacy, financial literacy, providing mental health supports, tackling racism, and promoting equity. We do not reduce rigor or lower expectations. We believe the DAS program is rooted in equity and provides real accountability and real equity, equitable opportunities for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. Good morning, uh, President Darling Hammond and members of the board, including the new ones. Liz Guillen at Public Advocates for the LCSF Equity Coalition. We support the waiver request to the U.S. Department of Education on how California calculates academic achievement and graduation rate indicators for alternative schools. We appreciate the department's transparency in sharing their work plan to continuously improve our multiple measures accountability system, but we would like the work plan to clearly and publicly include more robust teacher indicators for priority one, not just the teacher misassignments, but fully credentialed and properly assigned teachers. Also, the state science test should be included in the next dashboard, even if it's just status only performance. We know that what gets measured matters. And since status will be the way for all other indicators, it would not be confusing. And finally, now that we're submitting an ESSA addendum template, we think it's a good opportunity to refine the definition of English learners. Thank you, caller. Honestly, show the school needing support. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. My name is Kelly Garcia and I am a science teacher at Hutchinson Middle School in La Mirada, California. More importantly, I'm the grandmother to Hudson, Glenn, Olivia, and Miles, all future California public school students. I'm here today to strongly urge you to place a place science placeholder on this California school dashboard. We learned through the events of the past two years that having a scientifically literate population is important for our quality of life. In addition, the fastest growing careers in our state are strongly connected to science and technology, further emphasizing the necessity of an effective science education. When you consider that girls typically make career decisions by the age of 11, and many students in our underserved communities often don't know anyone who works in a STEM field, it is all too apparent that we must take steps to solidify accountability to ensure all students are equitably prepared for our future workforce. As a classroom teacher, I'm well aware of the struggles that teachers, schools, and districts have had in implementing NGFS. Thank you, Taylor. Yeah, long before COVID. Time is up. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. Good morning, Colleen Pagster on behalf of the Los Angeles Unified School District. Los Angeles Unified is concerned that making no adjustments 
cut points or indicator definitions will contribute to an over-identification of schools, particularly in terms of ATSI. The premise of the accountability system is to target supports at high-need schools. If too many schools are identified, it becomes difficult to do so, and the targeted funds that are intended for interventions and supports would be diluted. Therefore, we recommend that CDE conduct and make public a comprehensive analysis to determine the likely number of schools that will be identified in 2022, especially for ATSI, based on the proposed actions. In order to reduce the number of schools for targeted support, we ask that you consider using the available federal flexibilities by adjusting the definition of chronic absenteeism for 2022 accountability to acknowledge the impact of the pandemic and COVID-related absences. Lastly, we ask that CDE include 2019 student group performance as a factor for ATSI designation since one year of status does mm -hmm. not constitute chronic underperformance. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment for item number four. All right. <clears throat> Lots to chew on here. Uh, and I'm sure people have many, many thoughts. Um, I have a few myself, but I'm going to wait until uh, others have a chance to get their questions on the table. Uh, yes, Member Escobedo. Yes, you know, I just, I understand the LPAC cut scores. We had, you know, rigorous data analysis by researchers and, and people in the field. However, I, I, I do believe there needs to be an increase of confidence. And I just wonder if there's a way we can triangulate some scores along with these cutoff scores. What I mean specifically, like perhaps we can look at the percentage of long-term English learners and maybe um, average scale scores and see how um, they um, are connected to those schools that are either very high or in the middle or very low. So you, you would think that your very high school, according to LPAC, you would have you know, less number of, Eng of long-term English learners compared to the other levels as well as probably a higher uh, scale score average. So I just wonder if, if if we can look at data and associate data and connect data and create maybe more coherence to create more meaning. Uh, I, I would love to see that, that if, if that's a possibility in the future, of course. Is that something you wanna uh, ask um, Cindy to respond to at this Surely, point? Surely, please, please. Hi, this is Cindy Kazanis, Director of the Analysis Measurement and Accountability Reporting Division. Uh, so the, I think the comment that you're bringing up are, are, are mixing uh, data points that um, I would need to take back to the, to the team and to our policy advisory group. I, it seems to me as well that there's a lot of misunderstandings about the purpose of the indicator and what it's designed to do. Uh, and so I, I would like uh, President Darling Hammond if we can also touch base with the accountability liaisons on next steps so that we can perhaps clear clear the air and uh, make sure that the indicator um, is working as it was designed. But also when we think about how we select or how districts are identified for support, it's not just based on um, one indicator. And there is um, very specific methodology requirements that are outlined um, the board adopted those uh, those criteria, and so I think there's a, a lot more at this um, yeah. uh, as part of this particular issue than um, simply doing a, a simulation of various data points. Uh, is are there other comments or questions? Well, I have my little oh, there, uh, Member Rodriguez. Okay, thank you. And so uh, we're addressing all of the issues that were brought up, right, correct, in our comments? Yeah, the, any issues at this okay. point, this is the time to do it. All right, wonderful. Um, so, you know, with regard to the uh, DOS school waiver, um, I just wanna say that I'm in full support of it uh, because I, I understand what our students um, are, you know, especially our foster students who are in DOS schools, the support that they need and, um, you, you know, and, and, and I have a lot of uh, firsthand accounts with those students. And so I, you know, I just uh, wouldn't want to make, make the, um, 
you know, with the, uh, would like to, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really sick. And so I'm having a hard time getting my thoughts together here. Um, but, you know, I just, I really, uh, I'm, I'm in favor of the waiver and the calls and the letters that we received for all of those reasons. Um, second, I think that, you know, with regard to the cut scores, uh, we have a great opportunity here. One of the, my observations during uh, distance learning is that my students who really struggled were those who were extrinsically motivated or those who depended a lot on direction and, and um, you know, just constant, constant uh, monitoring as opposed to the internal motivation that as teachers, we want our students to have. Uh, and so I think this, you know, to look at the scores, to look at where we are now is, is, is a snapshot of how uh, we can move forward and take our students to, uh, you know, really focus on internal motivation and a love of learning that they can carry on uh, to their future studies. And in the event that, you know, we have to, uh, face something um, like this again, that our students are prepared, that they have the skills that they need. Uh, so looking at the at the snapshot now is the way it is, I think is really good information for, for all of us here in the state. Um, I'm also uh, concerned about science because I really, you know, I, I as the caller said, uh, what's measured is, you know, what's valued. And as uh, districts are looking at their um, at, you know, at their, at their planning for funding, um, if, you know, we don't have any science representation on there, it'll be hard to make determinations for the future. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there other questions or comments? I'd like to pick up on the last point that um, Member Rodriguez made and then Member Glover Woods, I'll come straight to you. I saw your hand go up, <laughs> uh, not electronically, um, the old fashioned way. Uh, on the question of science, I would like to ask, uh, it came up from several callers and it's an interesting point that we are reporting only status this year. Is there a reason why uh, we could not report status results for science in 2022? Is that your question too, Member Glover? Yeah. Member Darling Hammond. So we uh, will get the first test results of this data based on the new blueprint um, this fall. And, and for us to turn turn around something um, of a new test, um, I, I, I don't think is, I, I don't think it's feasible, but I will take it back to the team. We will have the conversation to make sure that, um, you know, we can roll, roll out um, any pieces of it, but in order to uh, put it out for informational purposes, because bringing it on for status and, and determining it's an indicator, you're gonna need to have further discussions about how you weight those academic indicators. And so um, there's, you know, it's not just simply putting information on and saying there's a status level, it's also saying, how do you value it in place of all of the other indicators? Because it's a very careful balance of um, academic versus uh, non-academic indicators on the dashboard at this point. Yeah, so that is something that the um, department is inviting states to reconsider because uh, the law does not um, include some of the constraints that were in the decision rule earlier. Um, but I, I guess the, uh, the companion question might be whether we could display it on the dashboard for informational purposes without uh, um, taking into account its use in accountability, which we wouldn't want to do until the following year anyway. So to use it for informational purposes. And I'm happy to bring that to you uh, back as, a, as an action item later on this year. Thank you. Uh, Member Glover Woods, you were raising your hand. President Darling Hammond, you asked the question that I was going to ask and I've received the response. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of others, but I want to just be checking to make sure nobody else has some um, questions. Uh, a second point that was made by a caller that I thought was a, a useful one, and you may already have this in mind to do, but I just wanted to uh, raise it was the, the, the question came up about in a toolkit for LEAs, uh, finding a way to help them explain all of the anomalous results because it is complicated and 
we're in our own learning mode and uh, every school board in the state will have its own learning mode. So I just wanted to let you respond to that question. Yes, absolutely. So uh, we did include a slide on a, a communications toolkit. It was a, a, an idea we dev definitely took from one of the letters um, and is something that um, we have done in years past. We've worked very closely with State Board of Education staff, <clears throat> excuse me, who have just a really keen insight on um, talking about these very meaty things um, in a very uh, basic manner so that the public um, can can understand and it's not not meant for just a bunch of, of, of data and accountability geeks um, so in in that in that term um, we will definitely be spending the next several months if not until we release the dashboard up until we release the dashboard on how to help with messaging and talking about this restarting of accountability and what it means and how districts and schools who are identified for support are actually supported in our system of, of uh, our system, our system of support, which is, of course, very unique in California. And um, I know that uh, our partners at, the, um, at CCEE and, and the county offices have been very eager to um, get this new set of data and start working with schools um, based on, on current information. Yeah, that, I truly appreciate that. And I, I think uh, the way you are stating it is very important that this really is about um, organizing support, so uh, that's terrific. Um, one other question that came up from a, a caller was whether in order to, um, if we did get to the point where criteria one and two were not sufficient to um, identify 5% of Title I schools, whether we might uh, not look in a global way, but for example, use the, um, delete the chronic absenteeism indicator or otherwise use the flexibilities that have been um, uh, indicated that the department might be willing to have around the selection process uh, rather than the, the version that we had approved, you know, however many years ago. Just wanted your thoughts and comments on that, on that kind of more refined approach if we have to go to a third criterion. Yeah, so I guess let me let me tease it out because I don't see the third criteria as being um, connected to the chronic absenteeism uh, statement. The chronic absenteeism statement is they want us to reset cut scores so that it's uh, not over identifying uh, schools. And if you recall the criteria, yeah, or, or not using it in the um, in the calculation was what I thought I was hearing. But to your point, yes, yes. So I mean, at, at this point, I mean that we are. Um, recommending that you use all indicators but the college career indicator. Uh, I, I do have to point out that one indicator will not get you, um, you know, identified, assuming that you have um, sufficient uh, and, and sizes for the other um, indicators. So it would be uh, extremely unusual that um, just by having read on chronic absenteeism that you would be automatically in. You'd have to have low performance on your um, ELA and math assessments, you'd have to have low performance, for example, as on your English learner progress um, indicator status, on graduation rate, um, and so it's, it's not a, a one and done. This is a multi-measures system for a reason. And uh, in, in doing that, um, you know, I, I, it's very hard to predict. I'm not going to predict, I said that earlier, on what, what, these, um, what these data will look like come um, fall of 2022. We know the field is, is hurting, especially on chronic absenteeism, but um, I, I would also just mention that if you are identified as a school for comprehensive support and improvement, you get money from the state. The state actually gives you funding to help support you in this effort. That is um, unusual in our system of support, the way it's designed these days. So just, you know, just a point of clarification on the eligibility process, uh, identification, and then um, I think it's, it's very difficult for us to do a bunch of what ifs, but at this point, we are recommending you stick with um, the indicators that we've recommended and with the cut scores um, as is. I think the concern will be if we, uh, we, we, we understand you don't want to predict and we want to um, have confidence. I think I have a fair amount of confidence in your uh, probability statement that we would probably uh, identify a sufficient number of schools with criteria one or two, one, one and two. Uh, we will, will want to 
avoid having to identify as many as you know seven or eight percent of schools if we can so if we get to that you know if we, if we have to cross that bridge we'll cross that bridge when we get to it uh, the last question that i uh, have is on the um priority one um the the full representation of priority one in the dashboard work plan which would include the percentage of fully certified teachers um, including those who are not properly assigned and those who are misassigned uh, as a proportion of the total. And uh, is there any reason we cannot add that to the dashboard um, work plan? So I, I, it is part of the dashboard work plan. I think um, folks overlooked the slide. Uh, maybe it would be helpful to bring it up on the screen in which um, we commit to, again, uh, convening an ad hoc advisory group uh, reporting that would provide feedback on the reporting of the data, including a review of the data elements. So what I have taken from the comments um, that were um, given today, as well as in writing, is that there's a disagreement about what data elements should be included. And so we will spend time to make sure we get that right. Um, I think that you know very well, because we've been meeting with you on this issue for the last two years, that these definitions <laughs> are not clean. <laughs> and um, we have um, been spending um, quite a bit of time this is really the most complex data set the department has ever dealt with. And so while it's um, 300,000 teachers, you're also um, combining that with our 6.2 million students and the classrooms in which they're being taught. And so that, um, uh, as well as matching it up with data that the Commission on Teacher Credentialing is giving us, um, it, it gives us a headache, but <laughs> we, are, we are working through it. And um, I, am, I am confident we're gonna be able to get some data out uh, fairly soon. But on the data elements piece, we will definitely um, conduct a, a thorough review to make sure that it is aligned with um, the intent of priority one in state law. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just reiterate that, you know, the, the uh, statistic that has been, you know, reported on misassignment uh, is often uh, reported alone, but it is, uh, and therefore it's often misunderstood and misinterpreted. Uh, it is the priority one states that uh, the, we're, we should be looking at the fully credentialed teachers uh, who are fully credentialed in their subject area uh, and the proportion who are misassigned. So in order to calculate the percentage who are misassigned, that is, they're fully credentialed but not properly assigned in their subject area, you have to have calculated already the percentage who are fully credentialed. So that data element is readily available, but it's rarely reported and it leads to a lot of confusion in the field. So um, I will um, just you know, um, assert again that uh, be, that is a data point we have because we couldn't calculate misassignment without it. And uh, it, you know, that piece of it, there are more complicated elements, which we all know about with having to do with teachers who have various other kinds of uh, permits or substandard credentials but the element of how many are fully credentialed from which we calculate misassignment should be, is part of priority one, should be part of the, um, the work plan for the department. Uh, and um, with that understanding, um, we could move, see if there's a motion to adopt the recommendation. Unless there are any other questions, I haven't seen any other hands going up. I move to adopt the recommendation. All right, do we have a second? I second it. All right, is there any further discussion? Uh, hearing none, uh, Brooks, can you call the roll for the vote? Member Rodriguez. Yes. Member Patillo Brownson. Yes. Member McQuillan. Aye. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Yes. Member Olkin. Member Lewis. Yes. Vice President Glover Woods. Yes. Member Escobedo. Yes. President Darlene Hammond. Yes. Member Banaka. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, and thank you so much, uh, Cindy and Joe, for the very thorough presentation and all of the work that uh, has gone into making this school year uh, 
able to present data. There were even questions about that at a moment uh, in time, uh, you know, and moving it forward in a way that is uh, well uh, thought through and will inform our stakeholders. We appreciate it. We'll come back around on those other questions uh, about um, science and other things and um, come back to the board uh, with those, those um, questions uh, on the table. So uh, at this point, we're um, just a few minutes away from noon. I think I, it makes sense for us to break for lunch, uh, take 30 minutes, uh, and come back at 12.22 uh, to resume the um, rest of the agenda. We'll see you then. Remember, don't leave the meeting. Just stop your video and your mic. Member Rodriguez. Here. Member Patillo Brownson. Here. Member McQuillan. Here. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Present. Member Olkin. Member Lewis. Present. Vice President Glover Woods. Here. Member Escobedo. Here. President Darlene Hammond. Here. Member Bonanca. Here. Have a quorum. All right. We are moving on to item two. Uh, item two is the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress and the English Language Proficiency Assessments for California. Approval of the revised student score reports for both the 2022-23 initial English language proficiency assessments and the initial alternate English language proficiency assessments for California and an update on our assessment program activities. Uh, and the item will be presented by Cheryl Cotton and Mal Bang of the CDE. Cheryl and Mal, take it away. Superintendent Thurman, President Darling Hammond, Vice President Clever Woods, and board members, I'm Cheryl Cotton, Deputy Superintendent of the Instruction, Measurement, and Administration Branch. To assist with this item, I have Dr. Mal Bang, Director of the Assessment Development and Administration Division to co-present. Dr. Linda Hooper, uh, Associate Director of Assessment and Administration Division, Marianne Arcilla, Executive Director from Educational Testing Service, Tony Alpert, Executive Director, and Dr. Magna Chia, Chief Strategy Officer from the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium as panelists to assist us with questions. The item before you today is an action and an information item. Next slide. Today's presentation will cover the following topics. We will provide an overview of the California Department of Education CDE recommendation for approval, as well as background information on the action item for today. Then we will go over some task and LPAC updates and finally, we will return to the CDE's recommendation for SBE item. Now I will hand the presentation over to Dr. Mal Vang, Director of Assessment Development and Administration Division. Thank you. Um, Superintendent Thurman, President Darling Hammond, Vice President uh, Glover Woods, and board members. As Deputy Superintendent um, Cotton mentioned, I'm Mal Vang, I'm Director for the Assessment Development and Administration Division. Um, in this section, I will provide an overview of the California Department of Education's recommendation for approval. So the California Department of Education recommends that the California State Board of Education approve the revised initial English language proficiency assessments for California or LPAC and the initial alternate LPAC student score reports for the 2022-23 test results as found in attachment two.
In this next section, I will provide background information on the action item. In California, our California assessment system overall, as background information, serves um, all our six million um, plus uh, students in kindergarten through grade 12, including in that about 1.1 million English learners, 800,000 students with disabilities, and 300,000 edu 300, educators in about 2,000 local educational agencies and about 10,000 schools, um, while administering about 20 million tests annually. So the California All, uh, Assessment of Student Performance and Progress, or CASP here, um, is an umbrella uh, assessment system. Um, in 2010, the California State Board of Education adopted the Common Core State Standards for English Language Arts, or ELA here, uh, and Mathematics. So per state law, California joined the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium in June 2011 as a governing state to work on the development of English and math assessments. The three components of the Smarter Balanced Assessments for English Language Arts and Mathematics here consist of the summative assessments, interim assessments, and formative assessment resources uh, in the Tools for Teachers system to support instruction and professional learning throughout the year. Uh, also, as addressed in state law, the CAS for uh, summative assessments include the following. Um, as I mentioned, the Smarter Balance Summative Assessments for English Language Arts and Mathematics which is administered to students in grades three through eight and 11. And then the California Science Test, or uh, we call uh, the acronym is CAST, which is administered to students in grades five, eight, and once in high school. We also have added re science resources in the tools for teachers for this assessment, to support this assessment. And then there is the California Alternate Assessments for English Language Arts, Mathematics, and Science. This is for students with the most significant cognitive disabilities as designated in their Individualized Education Plan, or IEP, Program, or IEP, excuse me. And then we also have the California Spanish Assessment for Spanish Reading Language Arts, which is an optional test administered to students in grades three through eight and high school. And then we have the grade two diagnostic assessments for English language arts and mathematics for local educational agencies that continue to test students in grade two. Oh, just a minute. Um, I wanted to just provide an, uh, a little quick background on the CASP. So the CASP, these CASP summative assessments are computer adapted or computer based uh, tests that measure what students know and can do in these content areas. And they produce scores that can be aggregated and disaggregated for the purpose of informing parents and guardians, local educational agencies, the public and the state about students achievement in their learning of the California academic content standards. So the CAS summative assessments also provide individual student results to students, parents and guardians, and teachers, and produce school, district, and county level results that allow for the monitoring of a school progress as well, and then produce results to meet the requirements of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, or ESEA, as amended by the Every Student Succeeds Act um, or, or ESSA and was enacted on December 10, uh, 2015. The other assessment under the California Assessment System is the English Language Proficiency Assessments for California or LPAC. So the LPAC serves multiple purposes. Um, the initial LPAC is the required state test for English Language Proficiency or ELP that is administered to students whose primary language is a language other than English, and it assesses listening, speaking, reading, and writing 
um, to eligible students, uh, or eligible students um, take this test or this assessment only once in their educational career. And the purpose of the initial LPAC, again, is to determine the English language proficiency of students enrolling in, in schools in California for the first time. So the process of administering the initial LPAC and notifying parents and guardians of the results is completed within 30 days, calendar days, of enrollment in a California public school. The summative LPAC here measures how well English learner students are progressing with English language development in each of the four domains, again, of listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And the purpose is to measure students' progress towards English language proficiency. As with the initial LPAC, this assessment is administered to students in kindergarten through grade 12. Students um, are assessed with the summative LPAC annually until they meet reclassification. Or, um, and it also supports decisions for students to be redesignated as fluent English proficient. The alternate LPAC is for English learner students with the most significant cognitive disabilities. Again, for students in, in kindergarten through grade 12, it is used for the same purpose as the initial and summative LPAC. The alternate LPAC is aligned to the 2012 California English Language Development Standards through the English Language Development Connectors, which are reduced in breadth, depth, and complexity. Um, however, the uh, alternate LPAC uses integrated task types that measure a student's expressive, meaning speaking and writing skills, and receptive, uh, meaning listening and reading skills. However, students can respond in their preferred mode of communication for all test questions. So some examples of communication modes are verbal, one word responses, or nonverbal responses, such as pointing, nodding, eye gaze, and using augmentative and alternative communication devices. And this assessment is administered one-on-one -on -one and in person. So we are in the middle of test administrations for the CASP and the LPAC. Uh, this slide consists of the testing windows for the administration of the CASP assessments, the Smarter Balanced uh, Interim Assessments uh, for English Language Arts and Math span the whole year uh, from August uh, 17th through July 30th, they'll be available. The California Alternate Assessment for Science is meant to be administered directly after instruction and is open from September 6th through July 15th. The CASP summative assessments um, overall for ELA, for English Language Arts, Mathematics, and Science, and the alternate assessments for the same content areas, uh, and the optional uh, California uh, Spanish assessment are available from January um, 11th through July 15th. Okay. And then the, the LPAC test administration windows for this year uh, the initial LPAC window opened in July 1st um, through, and it will be available through July, June 30th. And then uh, due to um, the holiday and systems updates, the first day of testing for next school year will begin on July 5th. And then we have our summative LPAC uh, window, which is open from February 1st through May 31st of each year. And then the alternate operational LPAC, alternate LPAC operational field test, excuse me. Um, administration window opened on November 1st of this year, and it has been extended through May 31st, 2022. And I'll provide a little bit more detail about uh, the status of our alternate LPAC operational field test in a later slide. So to help with this, um, item and to provide further background. Uh, on this slide uh, before you is the student score report development timeline. And as each, uh, as background information, as each test becomes um, operational, we have brought the proposed student score reports to the State Board of Education for review and approval. 
So in March of 2015, the State Board of Education approved the 2014-15 CASP student score report, which was the first students, set of student score reports for English language arts and math. And then in January of 2016, the State Board approved the 2015-16 CASP um, student score reports for English language arts and math. And, and then in May 2016, the State Board of Education approved the 2015-16 um, student score reports for the California Alternate Assessments for English and Math. That was their first year. Um, in December 2017, the State Board also approved uh, the 2017-18 student score reports for the summative LPAC um, assessment for the first time. And then in October 2018, um, we went through a period where we were transitioning from paper to electronic student score reports. So an informational, uh, an information memorandum was sent to the State Board of Education that explained the technical edits to the score reports and the transition from paper to electronic reports and the timing for that and the implementation plan. And then these technical edits and the resulting design that was applied to the English language arts and math was applied to all the CASP assessments. And that included the ELA math, the, the science, the California science test, the California Spanish assessment, and the California alternate assessment for English language arts and math. And then in September of 2019, the State Board approved the 2019-20 revisions to include the California alternate assessment for science at that time. And, and in addition, the revisions to the OPEC uh, student score reports. So the, the State Board of Education um, approved the 2020-21 initial OPEC student score report in January of 2020. And then the 2020-21 alternate LPAC student score reports in November of um, 2020. So it seems like I'm you know, going through each of these dates with you, but they're very important in how it kind of uh, addresses our timeline and what we're presenting today. So I just wanna make sure I provide some thorough background. Um, and in January of this year, the State Board of Education once again approved the revisions to the CASP and OPEC student score reports for this year, the 21-22 school year. And then finally, the CD is proposing that the State Board of Education approve the 2022-23 initial LPAC and, and initial alternate LPAC student score reports today. So in this slide, um, I will share the proposed revisions for the 22-23 initial LPAC and initial alternate LPAC student score reports as found in attachment two. The purpose is to ensure that the student score reports reflect the most up-to-date changes so that key information about student performance is communicated clearly to parents and guardians. The California Department of Education proposes removing the alternate assessment footnote on the initial uh, LPAC student score report, updating the unlisted resource footnote as a single asterisk, and making a minor edit to the language in the footnote. Because the initial LPAC, uh, alternate LPAC will be operational in July, um, local educational agencies will no longer need to administer local, uh, locally determined alternate assessments. So the alternate assessment footnote is no longer needed on the initial LPAC student score report. These changes are consistent with the summative um, LPAC student score reports that were approved by the State Board of Education in January of this year, 2022. And in that addition, uh, based on feedback from our interest holders, uh, the what is the, L what is the LPAC section has been incorporated into the Y section, um, both initial LPAC and the initial alternate LPAC student score reports to be consistent with other student score reports. And lastly, the performance level graphic has been added to the overall score and performance level box on page one to be consistent with the summative LPAC student score report. And the academic year was updated to 
uh, 2022-23 on both student score reports. So this is our uh, mega assessment update. So we do have some uh, specific uh, updates to share with you. I'd like to go over them in this next session. As I mentioned, I was going to go into detail a bit more about the alternate LPAC uh, operational field test. Um, the, this operational field test, um, the window again began on November 1st, 2021, and was scheduled to end on February 15th, 2022. However, um, throughout the whole field test, we monitor testing and as we wanted to make sure that the local educational agencies were able to assess all of our eligible English learner students with the most significant cognitive disabilities on this assessment. And because not all local educational agencies were able to complete testing, the testing window has been extended to May 31st to coincide with the close of the summative LPAC uh, administration window as well. And as of February 15th, approximately 60% of the eligible students have been assessed. So with the extension of the window, we anticipate that the local educational agencies will be able to assess 100% of the eligible students as we near the end of the administration window. Uh, we, are, we conducted the standard setting workshops with the, with the contractor ETS and California educators in late February and early March so our next steps in the development of this alternate LPAC will be to bring forward this, the standard setting plan uh, to the State Board of Education via an April informational, uh, information memorandum and the proposed threshold scores to the State Board of Education's review and approval at its May um, SBE meeting. So uh, transitioning to another update that we'd like to share um, is information about the Smarter Balance Demonstration of Concept Study. So in January, uh, the California Department of Education did provide information regarding this study conducted by Smarter Balance in partnership with the New Teacher Center. And this study um, stems from interests expressed by leadership in select member states in exploring the idea of through year assessments and other efforts to reduce the amount of time required for summative assessments at the end of the year. So considering these interests, um, Smarter Balance and a new teacher center developed this study which focuses on examining how embedding Smarter Balance performance tasks into classroom instruction uh, may reduce the time required for the end of year summative assessment process. So due to the challenges that local educational agencies have faced as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the study is now comprised uh, of solely two local educational agencies in California, uh, Valverde Unified School District, which is in Riverside County, is participating with grades four, five, and six, and high school, and Upper Lake Unified School District um, which is in Lake County, is participating at the high school level. The states of Washington, um, just as a note, uh, the, state, uh, the states of Washington and Hawaii were um, originally going to participate also, but ultimately they were not able to. So um, in this study, as a first step for participating, the educators um, were to attend an initial set of professional learning sessions hosted by the New Teacher Center, and then leadership staff from both the local educational agencies met with uh, the, st the staff from Smarter Balance and the New Teacher Center to create a customized uh, professional learning plan that would work with their instructional calendars. And at this point in the study, Valverde has uh, completed 16 of 26 planned professional learning sessions and Upper Lake Unify has completed seven of the nine planned professional learning sessions. And some um, additional key steps for participating educators in this year's study include um, implementing the performance task support activity, 
and then administering the performance task, of course, and collaborating with colleagues um, in scoring student responses and then planning for instruction based on data gathered. So this year's study is expected to conclude in May 2022 with a report to follow and further investigation into this area is anticipated for the new uh, for the 2022-23 school year. And more information will be provided in our CASP update section of the May um, SBE uh, item. So this brings me to the close of the uh, presentation slides. I want to remind you to follow us on Twitter at CDE Assessments um, to get some latest updates on all the development and administration activities we're doing. And at this time, I'm happy to uh, pause and, clear, and see if you have any clarifying questions that I may address at this time. Thank you um, so much, Mel. And could you put the call-in slide in up so that um, anyone who wants to queue up for uh, public comment can do so? Uh, and uh, I'll just remind folks that they can uh, make a public comment by calling the number and dialing the ask access code on this slide. Uh, and then while we're waiting for members of the public to call in, I'll share a couple of comments and then see if we have clarifying questions. And I see member Rodriguez is waiting with one. Um, first, I just wanna thank Mel for all the work that has gone on, not just um, in the last couple of months, but over this last year, trying to help us get through the process of doing assessments um, in the pandemic. Um, just Yeoman's uh, effort and um, two, two good results and the, um, uh, end of the, 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 the end of that process is happening now as we sort of uh, make sure that everything is uh, ready to move forward in a more, um, uh, I, I hate to say normal because that word has taken on so many connotations, but in, in a more systematic way. So thank you very much for that. I think that the proposals here make a lot of sense. I'm particularly excited to hear more in May about the proof of concept that Smarter Ballast is engaged in with the performance tasks being used uh, in the classroom during the school year. Uh, and we'll look forward to hearing more about that. Um, and we'll turn to clarifying questions. Um, Ide, uh, you are first up. All right, thank you. And thank you so much for this item. I really enjoyed the graphics and your presentation and the item itself. And I just have a clarifying question regarding, um, and it's, it may be something that, that you covered or that has been covered before, uh, but the SSRs, when they go home to the parents, are they also available to the parents in their home language? Yes, we do um, translate them into the top uh, seven languages in California. So they are uh, available. Hey, thank you for that. Welcome. Any, any other clarifying questions before we go to public comment? Seeing none, we'll open the public comment line. Uh, do we have any public comments? Uh, yes, we do. It looks like we have two people signed up for public comment. I will open the phone line now. Good afternoon, State Board of Education. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. I am Marta Hernandez of Californians Together, and we endorse the approval of the revised student reports for both 2022-23 initial LPAC and initial alternate LPAC. We want to express our appreciation for the revisions on the reports for both the forms to include the information on what is and why do we administer the initial LPAC. We are grateful for the opportunity to have provided input and collaborate with CDE staff on the new version of the form. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, Liz Guillen at Public Advocates for the Equity Coalition. Uh, we want to support this item, and we also want to thank, take the opportunity to thank the department staff for hearing the concerns that we raised about the student score reports and making the changes that we recommended. We think it's going to be helpful for parents as they try to make sense of all this information. And we also think it's important that whenever we can, uh, that we thank our colleagues at the department for all the hard work that they're doing. 
Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. That concludes public comment for item number two. I just think it's lovely that we get public comments thanking people for being so responsive to public input and uh, recognizing the efforts of the department. So uh, just like to launch us into a, a good discussion of this item um, with that uh, observation. Are there any other questions or comments from folks about this item? Yes, uh, Member Bonanca. Um, I have a quick clarifying question um, in terms of the smarter balance demonstration of concept study. Um, so if I'm understanding it correctly, um, teachers are embedding performance tasks in the classroom um, instruction as a way to prepare for the test, correct? Ultimately, it might be the way that the test is actually given um, rather than doing okay. it all at one time at the end. But I see that Tony Alpert has just popped up on the screen. Hi, Tony. Do you want to uh, respond to that question? Absolutely. Uh, so thank you for the question. Uh, we ultimately don't, we want uh, teachers to provide, uh, to improve student learning and to address the skills that the performance test measures. So the demonstration of concept gives a little bit of flexibility as to when uh, the A task might be administered, currently the interim assessment task, uh, and so that teachers can better fit uh, the task with their instructional plan, uh, but ultimately gives uh, a lot of uh, guidance and support and structure uh, regarding the higher order thinking skills that the performance tests address and helps uh, guide the teachers in how they can uh, provide uh, students with a scaffolding to bring their, their background and their assets to, into a instructional discussion that better helps uh, students acquire those skills. Uh, we, we anticipate that students will do better on the summative assessment, uh, but the primary purpose is to improve teaching and learning. And let me just say that um, there are more than 20 states around the country right now that are looking at different ways of organizing assessment. Um, you know, having been through the pandemic and you know everyone trying to figure out how do we give our assessments at the end of the year, but also feeling a need for information that informs teaching and learning throughout the year. There are a number of states that are uh, in one way or another looking at um, methods to do assessment that would allow uh, assessments during the course of the school year to be part of both informing instruction and uh, potentially to be rolled up as part of the score uh, rather than doing all of that at the end of the year, which for us, uh, because we have performance tasks in our um, assessments, which we're proud of and happy about, um, would allow shortening those assessments significantly at the end of the year as well. So it is at the moment, um, a way to test the concept. It's a proof of concept. Could we embed these tests in instruction? Um, how do they work? Uh, how do teachers and students feel about that process? And then you know, is there an implication for the end of the year? But uh, so these, the folks who are engaged in the pilot will give the, the interim performance tests now and will also still see performance tests in their end of year assessment this year. Got it. Um, thank you for the clarification. And just one more clarification. So if they're taking these tasks throughout the year, um, do, do teachers, if I'm understanding this correctly, get the data from those assessments and they're able to, to modify their learning to kind of fill any gaps in knowledge that they see, or is that data not available? Tony? Uh, so uh, the interim assessments provide data pretty much immediately uh, in the case of the performance tasks, it requires that someone, typically the teacher, uh, uh, fin uh, complete hand scoring, and then the results are available in the in the SERS, the uh, reporting system, California's educator reporting system, which they can then use uh, in a couple of different ways. Uh, they can uh, look at the students' responses. They can look at all the students' re responses in the class. They can connect to tools for teachers to find resources uh, that uh, address the same skills and, and uh, think about 
whether or not they can uh, they need to retool their instruction or or enhance or or address uh, specific concepts. Uh, they also have access to our annotated student response viewer, where they can see exemplar papers at each performance level and get an idea of where uh, their student performance fits in with the rubric based on uh, uh, similar students' writings. Um, and so part of the discussion then is. All that is available with the interim assessments. What is, as Linda was describing, we still have to think about then how do we transport that into a summative type environment where similar flexibility and benefits are available. Um, but right now we're just, we're getting feedback on, is this at all helpful? And, and so far the, the results are, are promising. Got it, thank you for that clarification. And I can just say as a student, um, I know that when my teachers kind of have implemented a similar type of teaching where we take tasks, um, like for example, tests, I know for my IB tests, we've done this a lot. Um, we take mock exams and they grade it and they kind of go back and teach us the things that, you know, they, they kind of fill in those gaps in knowledge. And I've found that it's been just extremely helpful. Um, you know, it, it really helped me, especially last year with my IB exams. And right now I'm, you know, using that method this year as well. Um, so, so I'm really glad that, that we're studying this. Yeah. And as you know, uh, with an IB program, you're taking some papers and projects during the school year that are being scored and taking some exams that are being scored and it all gets um, combined into a, a, an analysis. So um, it's actually a sort of a, a type of analog. Um, Member Glover Woods. Yes, a clarifying question around the calibration of the scoring um, related to the performance tasks. So how um, in this pilot are the scores that teachers are giving to the performance tasks calibrated from class to class and uh, with the schools that are participating in the study? Uh, so if I may, uh, uh, answer that. It's a, that's an incredibly important and complicated uh, question. The um, we provide um, let's see, the the uh, task. The all the interim assessment items are field tested uh, during the summative assessment, and it isn't until after uh, field testing is completed and we've uh, looked at the quality of the statistics associated with the items that we then determine whether or not those items go into the interim or the summative. So, um, uh, but they, they all meet the same rigorous quality criteria. Uh, and so that's how we, we calibrate from a statistical sense as to the relative difficulty of items. Uh, then regarding scoring as, um, each, uh, each performance task is associated with uh, papers, we call anchor papers, that help orient the teacher on the uh, requisite knowledge of skills that students need to demonstrate for a particular prompt uh, and, and what the associated level of the rubric uh, that performance would um, be associated with. And uh, teachers can uh, look at those and they can go through a process independently uh, to, to calibrate their own scoring against these uh, pre-scored papers. Uh, during the demonstration of concept, uh, the new teacher center is providing embedded and ongoing coaching and helping uh, teachers understand the rubric, understand the content standards uh, associated with the performance task that the performance task is measuring, and then helping uh, guide them on that critical process of calibrating their own evaluation uh, based on these other resources. And so uh, that is a, a substantial enhancement into the process that we think uh, is both uh, extremely helpful uh, and also essential as we, as we increase the complexity of the summative assessment and, and give that additional flexibility to teachers. So let me just also note that this uh, experiment, if you will, this, this proof of concept is not going, does not count at all in our end of year testing this year. This is a this is a an opportunity to see how it goes in classrooms, and some of those teachers are scoring the students' work. Uh, I think there may be some who opted out of scoring, and, and other teachers are scoring the work, and you know who are trained scorers, 
uh, because we do uh, for our assessments, you know, train scores routinely who are teachers. Um, and so they, they get the scores from, from someone else's scoring, but this is all um, for the purpose of learning at the moment. If we were ever to do something like this as part of the summative, there would be a training process, there would be a calibration process, there would probably be a back read and audit process that would take place as is common when you know uh, you use performance tasks. And as, as happens with the performance tasks now that are in the end of year exam. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming, Tony, nice to see you. Um, not a very long trip. I think you might've gone from your kitchen to your living room, but <laughs> to get online. And Mal, thank you for all the good work uh, that you've done. Um, I don't, I guess we do need a motion, yes, to accept the uh, new changes to the um, uh, score reports. Do I have a motion on that? I move. And here's the recommendation for approval. I assume you're moving this recommendation. Uh, and do we have a second? Second. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, Brooks, would you like to call the roll? Member Rodriguez. Yes. Member Patillo Brownson. Yes. Member McQuillan. Aye. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Yes. Member Olkin. Member Lewis. Yes. Vice President Glover Woods. Yes. Member Escobedo. Yes. President Darling Hammond. Yes. Member Banaka. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. And we're gonna move right along to item three, which is the Federal Every Student Succeeds Act authorization to pursue a waiver for the 2021-22 school year of the 1% cap on the percentage of eligible, eligible students with the most significant cognitive disabilities who may be assessed with an alternate assessment aligned with alternate academic achievement standards for English language arts, uh, mathematics and science or other related waivers. And this item will be presented by Cheryl Cotton and Mal Vang. Glad you didn't go far. And Cheryl, we're not hearing you yet, just to let you know. Superintendent Thurman, President Darling Hammond, Vice President Glover Woods, and board members, I'm Cheryl Cotton, again, Deputy Superintendent of the Instruction, Measurement, and Administration Branch. To assist with this item, I have Dr. Mal Vang, Director of Assessment Development and Administration Division to co-present, Dr. Linda Hooper, Associate Director of Assessment and Administration Division, and Shiloh Duncan Besseril, Associate Director of the Special Education Division as panelists to assist us with questions. The item before you today is an action and information item. A revised version of item three was posted on March 3rd to update the following. On page four of the item and page 16 of attachment one, we provided language to clarify how California intends to meet the 90 day requirement to submit a waiver request of the 1% cap on eligible students with the most significant cognitive disabilities who may be assessed with an alternate assessment for the 22-23 school year. On page eight of attachment one, the updated estimates were provided in tables eight and nine based on recent registration data. Today's presentation covers the recommendation for approval of and background on this action item request to the, to the United States Department of Education or ED. Today's presentation will cover the following topics. We'll provide an overview of the California Department of Education's recommendation for approval, as well as background information on the action item for today. Then we will go over some of the CASP and LPAC updates. And finally, we will return to the CDE's recommendation for SBE action. Now, I will hand the presentation over to Dr. Malving, Director of the Assessment Development and Administration Division. Thank you, Cheryl. Again, uh, 
Superintendent Thurman, President Darlin Hammond, Vice President Glover Woods, and board members. Um, I'm Mao Vang, I'm Director of the Assessment Development and Administration Division. In this section, I will provide an overview of CDE's recommendation for approval. And just to clarify, they have um, um, had a note that um, the recommendation here is um, that the CDE recommends that the California Depart uh, the California State Board of Education uh, authorized the California Department of Education to submit to the U.S. Department of Education the draft waiver package found in attachment one, which contains the following. Um, a request for a waiver of the requirement to assess 95% of students in the 2020-21 school year. Uh, request for a waiver of the requirement that these waiver requests be submitted at least 90 days before the beginning of our annual testing window. And request for a waiver of the requirement to assess less than 1% of eligible students with an alternate assessment for the 21-22 administration. Furthermore, um, the, we are asking for a request for an extension of our plan to report preliminary indicator results for the 2020-21 administration of the California Alternate Assessment for Science. Um, as um, background information, the State Board of Education has the authority to request uh, waivers for federal requirement as the designated state education agency. And, and that is why we are bringing this uh, to you. And then just going over the background uh, information um, regarding our, our recommendation. Uh, this is, this Per, um, excuse me, per our uh, per federal regulations, um, which is really uh, section 200.6 C2, the total number of students assessed using um, an alternate assessment aligned with alternate academic achievement standards may not exceed 1% of the total number of students assessed in the state. So if a state uh, expects that it will exceed 1% of students assessed with alternate assessments, the state needs to request a waiver of this requirement. So in order for a state to be eligible for the waiver of the 1% cap on alternate assessments, it must assess at least 95% of all students enrolled as, a, as well as 95% of students with dis, in the students with disabilities group in the previous year. Um, furthermore, a request of a waiver of 1% uh, of the 1% cap requirement must be submitted 90 days before the beginning of the state's annual testing window. So the CASP uh, summative testing window opened in, on January 11th, 2022. So as a result, uh, there is a um, a memo, memo from the U.S. Department of Education on October, uh, dated October 29th, uh, 2021, regarding this 1% uh, cap waiver. And they extended options to states to meet this requirement in light of the impact of the COVID pandemic in the 2020-21 school year. So based on CDE or California Department of Education's data analysis and survey results from local educational agencies. The California Department of Education anticipates that California will exceed the 1% cap for the 2021-22. And so the waiver package that the CDE um, wishes to submit uh, with the State Board of Education's approval involves a waiver of the 1% cap, as well as other waivers determined to be necessary due to the unique situation surrounding state testing throughout the pandemic. And um, I will cover each of these waivers in more detail in these slides. 
Um, so the first waiver is the participation rate of 95% for the 2020-21 uh, school year. So as I mentioned, in order for a state to be eligible uh, for a waiver of the 1% cap on alternate assessments, it must have um, assessed at least 90 5% of students enrolled, as well as 95% of students with disabilities in the previous year. And um, the Ed uh, did invite uh, states to request a waiver of the 95% participation rate uh, requirement for the 2020-21. Um, and although our state, California, offered all of our statewide assessments in the 2020-21 school year, uh, California did not meet the 95% participation rate. And this excludes the students who took local assessments as they are not counted toward the 95% participation rate. So um, due to the fact that uh, California did not meet this 95% participation requirement in the 2020-21 school year and meeting, and meeting this participation rate is required for applying for the waiver of the 1% uh, cap on alternate assessments. The CDE is requesting the SBE's author, authorization to request a waiver of the requirement to assess 95% uh, of students in the 2020-21 school year. The second waiver, the 90-day timeline for requests of the 1% um, waiver, uh, here, the, the deadline, of course, uh, from, um, from federal law uh, is for requesting a waiver of the, this requirements to assess, uh, to assess the less than 1% of students with an alternate assessment is that 90 days prior to the beginning of testing. Uh, again, because the testing window for the CAS has begun, the, Cal the California Department of Education cannot meet this timeline, and for this reason, the California Department of Education requests the SBE's authorization to request um, for a waiver of the requirement that these waiver requests be submitted 90 days before the beginning of the state's annual testing window. So as a reminder, uh, as Cheryl mentioned, a, a revised version of the item was posted on March 3rd with updates on page four of the item and page 16 of, the attach, of attachment one with language to clarify how California intends to meet the 90-day requirement in the coming school year, the 2022-23 school year. So to meet the requirement in the 22-23 um, school year, the uh, California Department of Education will analyze the data from this spring's administration, uh, 2022. And if California is projected to exceed um, the 1% cap we will bring, the CDE will bring to the SBE a waiver request for exceeding the 1% cap on eligible students taking alternate assessments in July to give us that time um, allotment to do so. The third waiver uh, is the 1% cap on students assigned the, uh, being assigned the alternate assessment for the 2021-22 school year. So California Department of Education has collected uh, surveys from local educational agencies regarding their expectations of um, number of eligible students participating in alternate assessments for the 2021-22 uh, school year. And we have also reviewed alternate assessment participation data from the 2018-19 as well as the 2020-21 school year. And the California Department of Education uh, anticipates and expects that um, the state will exceed the 1% cap on the percentage of our eligible students with the most significant cognitive disabilities who may be assessed with an alternate assessment for, this, for the 2021-22 school year. And for this reason, the uh, CDE requests the SBE's authorization to submit the waiver of the 1% cap for the 2021-22 school year. And on the following slides, 
I will review some of the participation rate data included in the uh, CDE's uh, and the waiver requests uh, package to the U.S. Department of Education. So this table um, consists of the California alternate assessment participation uh, rate of eligible students with disabilities um, by content area, ELA, English Language Arts, Mathematics, and Science for the 2020-21 school year. So the data indicates that English Language Arts and Mathematics exceeded the 1% uh, threshold and science was very close to the 1%. And this table um, shows the estimated number of um, eligible students for the California alternate assessments participation rates, again, by English language arts, mathematics, and science in the 2020, 20, in the 2022 school um, administration. And um, it's based on enrollment and registration and the estimated number of students assessed with the um, alternate assessments, California alternate assessments to meet the 95% participation rate. Again, as a reminder, uh, the revised version of the item was posted on Mar uh, that was posted on March 3rd on page eight of attachment one. Uh, the updated estimates were provided in tables eight and nine on recent, uh, based on recent registration data. And then the, the estimated overall CAA participation rates, uh, the, this one is the estimated um, overall participation rates for all students and in the, in, for this spring's test, the 2022 um, spring administration. It shows the, uh, this table shows the estimated number of eligible students overall for English language arts, mathematics, and science, and the estimated number of students that uh, who need to be assessed to meet the 95% participation rate. Overall, that uh, data from recent years and estimates for the 2022 administration indicates that California um, should request a, a waiver of the 1% cap on the percentage of eligible students with the most significant cognitive disabilities who may be assessed with an alternate assessment for the 2021-22 um, school year for English language arts, mathematics, and science. And then um, switching uh, again to more further background on the, the next topic um, is requesting an extension to use the preliminary indicators for reporting results of the 2021 uh, California alternate assessments for um, science. The, in, um, in the 2019-20 school year, uh, California Department of Education did plan that to be the science, uh, the California alternate science um, assessment for sciences administration to be the first operational field, uh, field test operational year. However, um, due to the COVID pandemic, again, uh, testing was suspended and the first uh, California alternate assessment for science operational field test was delayed for one year. And then during the 2020-21 school year, the California alternate assessment for science administration uh, due to the continued impact of the COVID pandemic, um, there was a limited number of eligible students who completed testing. Therefore, the California Department of Education delayed the operational administration of the test for another year. So California is now requesting uh, that the State Board of Education authorize the California Department of Education to request from the U.S. Department of Education an extension to use the preliminary indicator results for the 2020-21 administration um, for the California alternate assessments for science. 
And that summarizes um, each of the ask or um, request for waivers or request for extension that are in this uh, item. And it brings me to uh, uh, the summary slide here. So I will just remind you about our little Twitter account and following us. And I will pause for um, and answer any clarifying questions that you may have. Turn it back to you, President. Thank you. I, I appreciate the little PR plug for the Twitter account. <laughs> um, and I'll just say, I, we have a hot water heater being replaced here, so I've been kind of on and off screen a little bit. And if I disappear, uh, Vice President Glover Woods will be taking the gavel. So um, we're just, you know, keeping up with business today. Um, could you put up the public comment slide so that we can have callers queue up for public comment? And uh, I will uh, see if any of you and the um, board will have any clarifying questions while we're waiting for public comment and simply uh, say that uh, this is very um, helpful information. Mao, we, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, and uh, I don't have any particular concerns or questions myself. So any clarifying questions? Yes, uh, Member Glover Woods. And, and again, definitely support the need for the waiver. Just now a clarifying question on why we were not able to meet the 90 day window for the 2021-2021 school year. Um, yeah, so last school year we did, um, the board did approve us to extend the testing window all the way to the end of July for both CASP and LPAC. So we didn't, that also, uh, extended when we could have all the data available. Um, and we worked through the fall, so we did not publicly release our data until January 7th of 2022. So all the delays did not give us the information in a timely manner to be able to um, submit the waiver. And I think the Department of Education will, will understand all of that because there were states across the country that were urged to extend their testing windows if that would be enabling for the field. So we're not alone in that circumstance. That's right. Any other clarifying questions? All right, is there any public comment? Uh, we do not have an, anybody in the queue for public comments for this item. All right, uh, since there's no public comment, uh, we can see if there's any further board discussion and if there is no further board discussion, we can take a motion. And maybe now you want to, oh, uh, yes, Member McQuillan. Yes, just to follow up, uh, thank you for this presentation. Very technical, a lot of information there. Um, so there have been other states who have been already granted extensions and waivers in this area. That was kind of one of my questions, thank you. Um, yes, in terms of submitting them, I don't know whether they are approved, but yes, it's a process that the U.S. Department of Education uh, has available. So it, it, it depends on state's readiness. They submit it when um, they can. Yeah, and the point I was making was simply that many states did extend their testing windows last year as we did. And so then you can't calculate what your percentage of engagement was until later and so we will not be alone in that but uh, we don't know whether anybody else has been granted a waiver but the department will not be surprised yeah. by these kinds of requests any other uh, discussion questions or comments all right do we have a motion to uh, accept the board's recommendation of the department's recommendation I'll move to accept the recommendation on the screen. All right, and a second, Member second Rodriguez. Yes. Thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, Brooks, can you call the roll for the vote? Member Rodriguez. Yes. Member Patillo Brownson. Yes. Member McQuillan. Yes. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Yes. Member Olkin. Member Lewis. 
Yes. Vice President Glover Woods. Yes. Member Escobedo. Yes. President Darlene Hammond. Yes. Member Bonanca. Aye. The motion carries. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna move right on ahead into item five. Item five is the Eagle Collegiate Academy. Uh, we are, are to consider evidence regarding a notice of violation issued by the California State Board of Education. Uh, pursuant to California Education Code Section 47607G, and we will consider issuing a notice of intent to revoke with notice of facts pursuant to California Education Code Section 47607H. Uh, and I'm going to allow uh, Stephanie uh, Farland of the CDE to present the recommendation and the um, background. President Darling Hammond, I think we need just a moment here for Ms. Farland to connect. All right, we will. There we go. Member McQuillan, your hand is still up. Is that um, just left over from before? There you go. Thanks. Stretching my arm. <laughs> okay, Figuratively. President, President Darling Hammond, I, I believe we're ready to proceed. All right. Uh, Stephanie, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, President Darling Hammond, board members, Chief Deputy very nicely. It's good to see all of you. Um, today we are on to item five, and this item consists of the consideration of evidence regarding the notice of violation that was issued to Eagle Collegiate Academy by the California State Board of Education on January 12, 2022. Recommends, CDE recommends that the state board issue a notice of intent to revoke and notice of facts in support of the revocation of Eagle Collegiate Academy Charter School. Just um, a little background. At its July 8th, 9th, 2020 meeting, the state board approved the Eagle Collegiate Charter petition um, on appeal with conditions to establish a new school within the boundaries of the Acton Agua Dulce Unified School District with a scheduled opening date in 2021-22. So part of the conditions were that the school had an additional year to open. The charter petition stated its intention to serve 168 students in TK through grade three in its first year of operation. So here we have a timeline of board action. Um, this means local and county board. So we know uh, November of 2019, the Eagle Collegiate Academy petition was denied by the Acton Agua Dulce Unified School District by a, a vote of five to zero. It then went on appeal to the Los Angeles County Board of Education where they voted to deny on a vote of six to zero. It then came up to the State Board of Education on appeal. It was heard by the ACCS, the Advisory Commission on Charter Schools. Um, and the ACCS concurred with CDE's recommendation to deny the Eagle Collegiate Academy petition by a vote of seven to one with one abstention. It then came to the board, State Board, um, where the State Board approved it with conditions um, to establish a new school within the boundaries of Acton Agua Dulce School District. In September, the ECA opened virtually because they had yet to um, obtain a facility. On November 12th, 2021, the CDE sent a letter of concern to the Eagle Collegiate Academy 
That letter of concern was based on a report that the school had only 12 students enrolled. That letter of concern then, we, on January 12th, the SBE issued a notice of violation as they didn't remedy the issues in the letter of concern. And on February 15th, the ACCS, as I stated earlier, concurred with the CDE's recommendation and unanimously voted to recommend that the SBE issue a notice of intent to revoke to Eagle Collegiate Academy. And just as some background, the I know we have some new members today. So the Advisory Commission on Charter Schools is the Advisory Commission for this body. And they hear all of the charter items prior to the State Board hearing the items and they issue their own recommendation, apart from the CDE's recommendation. And to go over what, uh, what are the grounds for revocation of a charter school. Per Education Code 47607F, a charter may be revoked if substantial evidence indicates that the charter school did any of the following committed a material violation of any of the conditions, standards, or procedures set forth in the charter, failed to meet or pursue any of the pupil outcomes identified in the charter, failed to meet generally accepted accounting principles or engage in fiscal mismanagement, or violation of any law. So there is a, a process outlined in Ed Code for revocation. This process is not something that the department um, creates, we go by the ed code. So pursuant to 47607G, before revocation, a chartering authority shall notify the charter school of any violation and give the school an opportunity to remedy the violation. On January 12th, the SB 2022, the SBE issued that notice of violation to ECA and provided the school a reasonable opportunity to remedy the violations. ECA had failed to adequately refute, remedy, or propose to remedy the violations described in the notice of violation. Pursuant to Ed Code 47607H, before revoking a charter for failure to remedy a violation, the chartering authority shall provide a written notice of intent to revoke and notice of facts in support of revocation to the charter school. And that's what we are doing today. At today's meeting, the SBE will consider the evidence regarding the notice of violation and decide whether to issue a notice of intent to revoke and notice of facts in support of the revocation of ECA charter. Pursuant, and then the final step is the public hearing. So pursuant to Ed Code Section 47607H, no later than 30 days after providing that notice of intent to revoke, the chartering authority shall hold a public hearing regarding whether evidence exists to revoke the charter. No later than 30 days, the chartering authority shall issue a final decision to revoke or decline to revoke the charter. The chartering authority shall not revoke a charter unless it makes written factual findings supported by substantial evidence. At tomorrow's March 10th, 2022 meeting, the SBE may decide to hold a public hearing to consider the revocation of ECA charter and issue a final decision to revoke or decline to revoke the charter. The CDE's recommendation is that the State Board issue a notice of, of, of intent to revoke and notice of facts to ECA pursuant to Ed Code 47607H. The CDE will provide substantial evidence that ECA has committed the following, fiscal mismanagement, violation of several conditions, standards, or procedures set forth in the charter, in violation of provisions of law. At its February 15th, 2022 meeting, the ACCS concurred with the CDE's recommendation and unanimously voted to recommend that the SBE issue a notice of intent to revoke. Just as a summary of the ACCS meeting and the discussion that took place, um, ACCS expressed its concerns with Eagle Collegiate which were prim primarily focused on the following, failure to meet enrollment projections, significant overstaffing, fiscally insolvent beyond recovery, and inability to implement the program. So now we'll move into the instances of violation. 
The instances of violation that we have found are fiscal mismanagement, the budget is based on unrealistic enrollment, and there is a projected fiscal insolvency. There were material violations based on Ed Code Section 47607F1, failure to maintain adequate budget reserves, failure to timely acquire appropriate facilities, and a change to a non-classroom-based educational program. And then the violations of law would be the inadequate budget reserves and non-compliant independent study written agreements. We're gonna start with the fiscal mismanagement because I'm sure as you read in the item, this is the most serious of the violations and the violation that really cannot be remedied at this time. As cited in the notice of violation, ECA based and continues to base its budget on an unrealistic enrollment. And we have here just a little timeline of the enrollment of ECA. When they were approved, they outlined a prospective enrollment of 168 students. In May of 2021, ECA reported a prospective enrollment of 131 students. ECA reported an estimated October enrollment of 168 students via the pupil estimates for new or significantly expanding charters, PENSEC. And that is the way that new charters project how, much they, how many students they'll have enrolled, and that is what their LCFF um, uh, is based on, their projection. In September of 2021, ECA communicated that the school began with an enrollment of 131 students. In the beginning of November 2021, ECA reported a total enrollment of 12 students via the Charter School 20-Day Attendance Report. Once we saw that report and saw that they only had 12 students, we immediately sent a letter of concern to the school in early November. As of today, or as of February, but I believe as of today, the reported ADA continues to be 12 students. So ECA responded to this violation, and I will go over ECA's response and then our response to their response. So ECA responded to this violation by providing CDE a revised budget. Their revised budget included their projection of enrolling 45 new students by April 19th, 2022. ECA stated that it anticipates that these students will enroll once a facility is secured. That would give them a total of 57 students. With 57 students enrolled, ECA anticipates having an ADA of 27.53, which reduces this local co control funding formula overpayment um, from 497,000 to 329,000 for fiscal year 2021-22. The revised budget also includes um, decreased enrollment projections over the next couple of years from where they started out. Our analysis of that revised budget that came in post uh, notice of violation um, is that even if we used ECA's own projections, which we disagree with, I, we don't uh, believe that they would be able to get 57 students um, by next month. We're in the middle of, we're in March of a school year. Um, but even if we went with their projections, they still maintain a negative ending fund balance of 302,000 at the end of fiscal year 21-22. We also are um, still believe that the projected enrollment they have for the next two years, fiscal years, are unrealistic and inconsistent, not only with their own growth patterns, but with growth patterns in other charter schools. As stated in the notice of violation, ECA based its fiscal solvency on an unrealistic and overestimated estimated enrollment. ECA responded to this violation, as I said, by providing a revised budget. Um, with their own projections, they estimate that they'll have an ending cash balance of $4,000 uh, for fiscal year 21-22. Our analysis of their revised budget is that ECA is not fiscally sustainable. 
ECA's revised budget includes a deficit of $282,497 and a negative ending fund balance of $302,000. They also project that, the, that their public charter school grant program funds will be allocated to them. Their public charter school grant program funds currently are on a payment hold. There is an enrollment minimum in order to receive and participate in the federal public charter school grant program. They are nowhere near that minimum, and they would have to be up to 75 students by the end of the school year in order, to, in order for the department to reissue any money from those funds. Um, they are unlikely, that grant, oops, sorry, went forward faster than I wanted to. Um, those funds um, are unlikely to be restarted for the school. In addition, ECA includes in their budget, proposed budget, elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds. We know them as ESSER funds. Um, and ECA is not eligible for those funds this year or next year, as they do not have enough FRPM students enrolled this year. They need at least 37. And as I said, they only have 12 students total um, to be eligible. And so we did, uh, verify that yesterday with our ESSER folks, um, that they will not be eligible for that funding. So ECA has failed to take steps to balance its budget also by adequately reducing expenditures. And that is something that the ACCS discussed in their meeting in terms of um, overstaffing. They have four and a half staff for 12 kids. Um, so uh, really we feel like they have failed to take the steps to balance their budget. So the CDE's practice is to evaluate fiscal solvency based on a school's actual enrollment. So the budgets that were submitted by ECA are based on the enrollment they project they will have by the middle of April. Our analysis is based on their actual enrollment of 12 students. Based on those 12, of, of enrolling only 12 students, the CDE estimates that ECA's LCF repayment will be 497973 And I don't know that I mentioned this before, but the reason we keep talking about repayment is the first LCFF payment that ECA received was based on their 168 projection enrollment during the PENSEC. So they received that money, but they only had 12 students. So they were overpaid by almost half a million dollars. Um, and that money is owed back to the state. So I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear, but when we talk about repayment, it is the LCFF payment, um, overpayment that was given to them earlier this school year. In the ECA's report, you will notice that they have discussed having a repayment plan for that overpayment. Um, they put in their budget that they could repay that overpayment over the next two years. And I want to be really clear that a charter school cannot dictate a repayment plan for an overpayment of apportionment. And the CDE nor the SBE have the authority to grant a repayment plan for charter school overpayments. So the school will be invoiced and they will be required to pay that invoice at once. ECA may have a negative ending cash balance of $488,353 by June of 2022. ECA will fail to meet its financial obligations by May of 2022. And financial obligations all obviously include teacher salaries, teacher health benefits, teacher retirement. If operations continue, apportionment payments begin in July 2022 will also be offset to recover any remaining LCFF payments, which, which means that even if this school stays open, they will not receive any new LCFF funding even next year until that overpayment is made back to the state. So this chart just sort of puts it out in black and white on a chart of what our analysis is of their cash balance and their ending fund balance at the end of the 21-22 fiscal year.
On March 4th, which was last Friday, ECA submitted another revised budget to the, the CDE. Um, we have conducted a, conducted a preliminary review of that budget. Um, it just came in on Friday, so we didn't have time to do a deep dive, but we did look at it um, quickly. And based upon our preliminary review, the CDE finds that ECA remains fiscally unsustainable. So violations of the charter. Failure to maintain adequate budget reserves. As stated in the notice of violation per the MOU between ECA and the state board, ECA is expected to maintain reserves at 5% of expenditures or 71,000, whichever is greater. At the time of the notice of violation, the CD projected ECA to have a negative ending fund balance of $1.2 million. So obviously there's not a reserve there. ECA responded to this violation by providing a revised budget, but their own projections in a negative fund balance of 302,000. So obviously there's a difference there between our two analyses, but either way, they're in a negative fund balance. CDE analyzed the revised budget. Again, we find their projections to be based on unrealistic, unsubstantiated, and inflated enrollment for 21-22. And CDE projects that based on ECA's current enrollment of 12 students, they will have a negative ending fund balance of 598,000 by June 2022. And really, that actually is probably a little higher because we were including their ESSER funds in some of our analysis, but since we found out that they're not actually entitled to ESSER funds, those numbers go up just a little bit. Failure to acquire appropriate facilities. As stated in the notice of violation, ECA's charter required ECA's school facilities to be completed and ready on or before May 28th, 2021. Remember, they were approved July 2020. They were given an extra year to open. So they had an extra year to find a, an appropriate facility for their students. They failed to open a facility as a classroom-based charter school by the SBE approved date or before the start of the fiscal year 21-22. They started school on September 7th. They still did not have a facility. On December 6, 2021, ECA informed the CDE after we had sent the letter of concern that it had obtained a short-term lease at a temporary facility. We expedited, we were down there within days, we expedited a visit to the facility and inspected it on December 16th and found the facility to be non-compliant. ECA responded to this violation by proposing to hold class in a different building located on the same property of the lease site. They notified that they notified us of that after the notice of violation was um, submitted um, or approved by the, by the State Board of Education in January. So once again, we expedited a second visit to inspect the new building of the newly proposed facility on February 10th. The CDE pre-opening site inspection checklist for this newly pro proposed facility is linked under the documentation considered by the ACCS section in the item. What our facilities division found um, was that the facility was still out of compliance and we still had several outstanding concerns about that facility, which are all written in that report. Additionally, the newly proposed facility is located within two nautical miles of an airport runway. Pursuant to Ed Code 17215, before acquiring Title II or leasing property for a new school site, a charter school shall give the CDE written notice of the proposed acquisition or lease and shall submit any information required by the CDE if the site is within, is within two miles measured by airline of that point on an airport runway that is nearest to the site. Pursuant to the same Ed Code 17215C, the California Department of Transportation, Caltrans, is required to evaluate that proposed K-12 school site as they are any K-12 school site that are within two nautical miles of an airport runway. So to be clear, Eagle Collegiate Academy did not do its due diligence. The school is required to submit this information prior to leasing the property and prior to using any public funds for that property. This did not happen. 
Once we learned that there was an airport runway within two nautical miles of that charter, CDE submitted a request for this evaluation to Caltrans. We are in the process of, that, of their review and have not received any formal letter approving that process. So students cannot occupy the site until the Caltrans findings are officially reported. In addition, the facility is in, insufficient to accommodate ECA's projected student enrollment. So if they get the approval from Caltrans and they remedy the deficiencies that CDE still has with the site, the site will only hold a maximum of 34 students and ECA is projecting, as I said earlier, 57 by the end of this school year. So the newly proposed facility will not accommodate this projected enrollment level, even if it becomes compliant. And the facility is a temporary lease, as I said earlier. The facility is only leased through the end of this school year, and the school does not have a site for next year. As outlined in the notice of violation, ECA's petition outlines a classroom-based international baccalaureate educational program. However, ECA has reported that its students are receiving online instruction only via independent study. ECA responded to this violation by stating that its curriculum has not changed. It has been forced to conduct instruction virtually due to challenges in obtaining a facility. And we're not disagreeing with that, but it is a violation of, of their petition in that they were only a Approved for an online, for an in-classroom based IB program. And as we know, online and remote instruction significantly changes the way an education program is delivered and received by students. Violation of law, we stated earlier, inadequate budget reserves. And I stated all of this earlier, but just to go over it again, ECA is expected ma to maintain reserves at 5% of expenditures, whichever is greater. Um, they've only been open this school year, but out during that time, they have not been able to meet this requirement. A second issue, uh, violation of law, was their non-compliant independent study written agreements. Because they were an online program or have been or continue to be for this school year, they were required by law to have independent study written agreements which, with each of the students and families. There, uh, in our notice of violation, we stated that ECA's independent study written agreements were non-compliant. They responded to this violation by claiming that their independent study written agreements are compliant and that the information was clearly communicated to families. We find that they have been out of compliance for the majority of the 21-22 school year. On February 25th, ECA did submit a draft of a revised independent study master agreement showing that this violation has been partially cured. However, ECA still has not submitted revised independent study written agreements for each of the students signed as they're required to be by law to the CDE. The last issue uh, in the notice of violation that we had uh, pointed out was uh, on December 1, 2021, the El Dorado Charter Special Education Local Plan Area, SELPA, issued a formal notice of its concerns about ECA's ability to function as an LEA, in that ECA at that time had not set up a child fine process, and the SELPA was concerned that students with disabilities were not receiving their due services. However, since that time, the El Dorado Charter SELPA has confirmed that ECA has resolved the issue stated in the SELPA's letter of concern. So in summary, the CDE, this is the battery's running low here. Um, the CDE concludes that there is no fiscal viability for ECA moving forward. Based on our analysis, the CDE estimates that ECA will have an estimated negative ending cash balance of 488,353 and a negative ending 
fund balance of 598,000 by June 2022. ECA will fail to meet its financial obligations, including but not limited to staff salaries, pension obligations, and benefits by May 2022. And payments beginning in July 2022, if there were any, would be offset to recover any remaining LCFF overpayment. So in conclusion, there is substantial evidence that ECA has committed the following. Fiscal mismanagement, violation of several conditions, standards, or procedures set forth in the charter, violation of provisions of law. ECA has not adequately refuted, remedied, or proposed a plan to remedy the aforementioned violations. We are recommending that the State Board of Education issue a notice of intent to revoke and notice of facts to ECA pursuant to Ed Code Section 47607H. At its February 15th meeting, the ACCS concurred with the CDE's recommendation and unanimously voted to recommend the same. The CDE has contacted the districts of residence for ECA's current students. All districts have confirmed in writing that they are prepared to provide appropriate educational placement of any student who resides within their district boundaries. And we also, and I'm sure you'll hear from them later, we also have that confirmation from the LA County Office of Education. And that concludes my presentation. I'm on mute. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, we want to be able to hear from Dr. Ogo Koye Johnson, who is the CEO of Eagle Collegiate Academy. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Koye Johnson, please begin. You have about 10 minutes. Uh, then we will take public comments after that. Dr. Clary Johnson. Um, ECA is waiting for the for my slide to be uploaded. Oh, thank you. <laughs> by by um, CDE, SBE, I submitted it to them. So once they start, I would start. Okay, thank you. They have a PHSBE. I can see it in the folder. Dr. Koya Johnson, are you able to share from yours? The staff was not informed uh, that we were to present from here. And so we've been expecting you to be sharing from your side, which you can do through your Zoom function. Um, yes, I could, but in, uh, in the meeting that we had, I was told that if I submitted, then they would share it, but um, it's okay. I would have to pull it up. I was ready for that to be done by staff. So. We, have, we have a copy here we can open if that's what you'd prefer. Well, that's what I that's what I thought we were doing because that's why I sent it in. But I also have it. If, if you do it, then we're all on the same page. It looks like it's about to happen. So okay. we, we thank, can you. Open thank you, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> All right, I think we have the slide. And Dr. Clay, yes, go right ahead. Please begin. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, Honorable Madam Board President Dr. Darlene Harmon, Honorable Board Members and CDE staff. 
My name is Dr. Ogo Koye Johnson. I am the founder and the chief executive officer of Eagle Collegiate Academy, thanks to you. With me today, uh, our legal expert, Ms. Ruli, and our fiscal expert, Mr. Adams. We are a K through eight public charter school currently serving grades K through third and are the first and only international baccalaureate primary years program candidate school serving the Antelope Valley and the Santa Clarita Valley communities. On behalf of our entire ECA community, thank you for taking the time to hear us today. We are asking the State Board of Education, next slide, to delay action on a final decision to revoke the ECA charter. Such a delay is well within SBA's discretion and is consistent with its regulations on this topic. We are asking for the following reasons. To minimize the devastation and the disruption of the lives of the students and their families that will come with immediate school closure. To give ECA students time to use the facility that has been set up for them for in-person instruction, which has been so long promised and which Caltrans has cleared and notified CDE via email that is clear to use. ECA has sufficient financial resources to finish out the school year, despite the CDA's assertion to the contrary. ECA will have the opportunity to receive its already approved public charter school grant program if we do get in person of $300,000, as long as we meet the program's enrollment threshold, which we believe we would meet. To avoid losing ECA's hard fought for IB candidacy, to use the already paid for year long instructional and intervention materials that have been purchased that the students are using, and all our current families have re-enrolled for next school year, and new families have also enrolled of 92. Not only did the current families re-enroll their current students, they enrolled some of their siblings as well. We are conducting a robust enrollment campaign, which includes email campaign, social media campaign, we've been doing this, door-to-door -door campaign, and follow-up phone calls with families. Some families have taught the facility, and this is why we know that we have this enrollment. Next slide. As some of you know and remember, the State Board unanimously approved ECA's petition with conditions July 8th with a one-year delayed opening. And because of the pandemic, this is why that happened. Our families and team were overjoyed at that prospect after fighting for four years to bring this excellent program to our communities. There was no way for anyone to predict that we will still be battling with the pandemic today. California was under the lockdown stay at home order from March 19, 2020, and never really fully opened until June 2021. ECA is caught in an impossible spiral. We cannot enroll more students until CDE approves our facility. ECA cannot repay its debt to the CDE until it can open our facility and enroll more students and get some of the funding that we have. So we are here today asking for a life raft to pull us out of this spiral. We ask for the sake of our scholar eagles, that's what we call our students, of our families and of our community to delay the final action on this revocation of ECA's Hartford Charter. Next slide. We recognize the weightiness of this heartbreaking situation for the SDE, heartbreaking for the CDE, and for our whole ECA community, it's heartbreaking. We appreciate all the work that CDE has done this school year to help us get started and running. But we have been shocked lately by their complete change in tone as of December. We have been upfront with the CDE since its charter was approved. And there is no evidence of any intent by the ECA team, anyone, to provide CDE any incorrect information, which CDE has alleged. On May 28, 2021, we notified CDE that our facility was not ready at that time. So they knew, and we shared that information in a written document that was submitted to you. In December, ECA received a phone call from the director of the CDE Charter Schools Division. The director has never called. <laughs> And so she explained that the CDE's intent is to prepare the SBE to revoke ECA's charter. And the director promised to send a link to a previous SBE charter revocation because she was not there at that time so that we can see it and see what we would have to go through 
and make a decision, but we never received that link. The director has fast-tracked this revocation process and has dismissed the genuine remedies and refutations that EC has presented. We have told them, whatever you need us to do, we will do it, please tell us. And we have been distressed over the lack of consistency in communications from the CDE. For example, the CDE's facility and charter schools division staff told us verbally that the youth ministry would work. But then when we got the facility report, it said that it would not work. And then when they came in December, they indicated that the site was not near any airport runways. But then the February report states that it is. It feels as if though the goalposts are constantly being moved down the field. But thankfully, Caltrans has notified CDE via email that the current church site has been cleared by Caltrans. It is now up to CDE to approve the site to be used. In July, next slide. In July 2020, you gave us a chance to fulfill our calling, and we stand before you or sit before you today saying that we have done so. Maybe not with the number of students we had wanted to, but all our families are happy and have re-enrolled for next school year in addition to new families. ECA students are thriving and showing growth based on the teacher and NWEA MAP growth test, thereby meeting the learning outcomes of our charter. And we were in communi communication with IB throughout this process. Our team is confident it will increase its enrollment once it's allowed to start in-person instruction because we know our families, we know where they are, we have gone door to door to them, and we put those systems in place to do so. Please allow us to fulfill what you allowed us to start. There is a great need for ECA in our communities, and we can show that based on our enrollment campaign that we have been conducting. Revoking the ECA charter will only continue perpetuating the cycle of struggling communities being silenced, ignored, instead of supported and buoyed. We still have five years of our charter term left. We are literally new. Please allow us to prove that we can implement this educational program despite the challenges of the pandemic. Next slide. The budget we submitted for this meeting projected an AD of 13.5. 51 by the P2 attendance report, which is what we're using, even though we know that we, in order to receive the public charter school grant, can get more students before the end of the year, which is June 30, 2022. However, because of the fundraising campaign we've been doing, we have received pledges, which we have submitted to SBE and CDE of $530,000 so far, and we are still expecting more from our capital fundraising campaign. People are still, just the idea of trying to close this school is heartbreaking that people are just coming out and donating and pledging to ECA. And we also have 92 application forms, which we shared in our report. So we know that our projection of 168 students for next year is realistic. We have people calling as they receive our email and other campaigns. Next slide. We have pledges of up to $530,000, like I just mentioned, which will help us to repay the LCFF, but it will also repay the fund balance that has been mentioned earlier. If ECA is allowed to continue to operate, because that's then how we can pay CDE back and also make sure that we meet that fund balance. Next slide. ECA was in regular communication with the CDE during the summer and early fall of 2021 based on information that we submitted to you in our report. Again, Caltrans has cleared this site to use. It's now up to CDE to sign it off. And we requested how they would like us to notify them of all the other things that we have already cleared from their February report. And to date, we have not received information as to how to do that. We do reach out to CDE. We ask for information to help us meet their requirements. Dr. Koya Johnson. Next slide. Dr. Because Koya, ECA Dr. could Koya not Johnson. operate in its prison Pardon, facilities. Pardon me, uh, the 10 minutes has just come to a close. If you'd like to make a concluding statement. And so once again, we ask that the SBE delay final action on the revocation of ECA's charter in order to allow sufficient time for the facility to be up and running. There is no legal or procedural need to fast track revocation, and it will only harm students by removing them from their school home, 
during the middle of the year. We have repeatedly cured alleged violations, reached out to CDE, including about independent study agreements and everything else. And we'll, we'll like to show you this current slide Thank you, where you would see where we are. Next slide. Can we show the state board the slide of this current place where they, so they can see Dr. Okoye Johnson, I apologize. The time has come to a close. Thank you for your comments. All right. Thank you so much for your time and for hearing us. I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, we want to put up the public comment slide so that people can queue up for public comment. Uh, members of the public who uh, want to provide comment on this item can do so by calling the telephone number and using the access code provided on the slide that is shown now. Uh, and while we're waiting for uh, members of the public to queue up, I want to just ask Vice President Glover Woods if she has any initial comments as State Board Liaison, uh, and then we will um, go to public comment. Uh, President Darling Hammond, thank you so much for the opportunity um, to share. I just want to concur and underscore that um, the fiscal concerns that have been shared in the presentation from the CDE staff um, are of primary concern. The fiscal insolvency um, that has been outlined is, um, again, something that is of grave concern, the fact that they uh, are slated to run out of funds before the school year does come to a close. And I would like to also underscore that the um, Advisory Commission on Charter Schools discussed this revocation um, and heard uh, some uh, very similar comments during their meeting in February. And uh, for our new board members, just to know that the ACCS is a board that is comprised of um, multiple, multiple educational partners, if you will, uh, op charter school operators, parents, teachers, county superintendents, district superintendents, and governing board members. So it's a diverse body that uh, takes care to listen to the issues brought before them before uh, giving recommendations to this body of the State Board of Education. So the ACCS did unanimously recommend that the State Board of Education uh, issue a notice of intent to revoke to Eagle Collegiate Academy. Uh, they also were very concerned about the fiscal solvency. And um, I'd like to move forward, uh, President Darling Hammond, when you deem appropriate for public comment at this time and the um, conversation and discussion amongst the board members. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move to public comment. Are there any public commenters? Uh, yes, there are currently 17 callers in the queue. I will open up the phone line now. Good afternoon, State Board of Education. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. You have one minute. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Don Hakeem, and I have been involved with Eagle Collegiate Academy since the very beginning. I am urging you to please <coughs> reconsider and work with us. We are working <coughs> very hard to drive fundraising and enrollment and we really believe strongly that our academic program is doing so well and our families are so happy with it. So um, we just need a little bit of help. If we can just get a facility and if we could have help with that, then everything else will really fall into place. And we've, we feel like we've been going back and forth and we're really at a point where we have the site ready it can be our launching ground, and then we will be able to repay back these funds. Schools are busy. Thank you, Kelly. Your time is up. And Thank you, caller. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Juba, and I am a classroom teacher representing the California Teachers Association. CTA supports the CDE's recommendation that the State Board issue a notice of intent to revoke with notice of facts to the Eagle Collegiate Academy. The issues with ECA outlined by the CDE in the item are egregious, and CTA would like to highlight that the consistent pattern of shifting enrollment numbers led to ECA being overfunded by almost 
$500,000 in public funds. Perhaps the most troubling shift occurred with ECA reporting to the CDE on September 30th that they started school with 131 students, and then their attendance report only had 12. ECA's actions are reminiscent of the A3 scandal, and we believe it would be prudent for the CDE to investigate ECA's actions to determine if this was gross management, gross incompetence, Thank you, or fraud. Thank you, Paula. Your time is up. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. You have one minute. Hi, I'm calling because I would like you to support um, ECA. I'm a mother of second grade uh, student, and he's so happy over there. And I would like you to give him a chance, to give them a chance. And even my son is here, and he wants to say something. Oh, Papa. I love to... I love my school. Please support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Good afternoon, board members. My name is Indra Ciccarelli, and I am the director of the Charter Schools Office for the Los Angeles County Office of Education. Back on July 8th of 2020, we presented to this board with the county and district's concerns with the Eagle Collegiate Academy Charter Petition. We found the petitioners demonstrably unlikely to successfully implement the petition, and in particular, we noted the petitioners' unrealistic enrollment plans and an underestimation of the cost and time it would take to bring an identified and wholly unfit facility into compliance. Despite an extra planning year and the petitioners' strong assurances to the contrary, these dilemmas have indeed come to pass to the detriment of their students and community. The school has enrolled only 12 students inadequately adjusting their budget, and has been unable to secure an appropriate facility, providing a remote educational program that is deficient and in violation of law. Your staff have provided a detailed and compelling report. Eagle Collegiate Academy is not a good option for its community, and it is in the best interest of this community for the school to close. The district and county are prepared to help- Thank you, Paula. Your time is up. to other more productive educational options. I urge you to revoke this school. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. It can't be too loud. Good afternoon, caller. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. Caller. Oh, hi. My name. Go ahead. Uh, hello. My name is Ashley Cousteau. I am a teacher at Eagle Collegiate Academy, I'm the second and third grade teacher. And this school means so much to the staff and the faculty and the students and the parents. And we have done so much to try to meet your needs and to be able to keep these students going. And they are dreading the idea of their school closing down. Their grades are phenomenal with how much time that they are given in class with not as many students, but given the best instruction possible. And they just want to finish off this school year and continue at their school. And if you could please help us, work with us, because these students would be Thank you, so devastated. Thank you, Carla. Your time is up. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. Okay, moving on. Uh, next caller, please state your name and affiliation. Your time starts now. Hello, my name is Jack Ritter, and I'm a community member at, in Agadouce. And I just hope that you guys please let ECA continue. I think it is important for these students to have consistency at this young age and be at the same facility with the same teachers. I think change may be detrimental to their development at this stage of their lives. The teachers at ECA have done a great job educating the students and the improvement is evident in the, in the facts in the school. Uh, the relationships built between the teachers and the students are very important for these students' lives. And I just hope that you please think about the students' lives when making these decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. You have one minute. 
Hi, my name is Paulina, and I'm calling in support of Eagle Collegiate Academy. ECA is providing value to students, and I'm asking you not to close the school. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. You have one minute. Hello, my name is Rita Salai. I'm the EC Board of the Director uh, member, and I'm calling for supporting and uh, asking please do not disturb our children's lives by closing the school where they are thriving, learning, and growing every day. Uh, closing ECA before the school has the opportunity to serve all the families that were that want to attend and perpetuate why the rich keep getting richer and the poor keeps getting poorer because you would be taking away the opportunity for children to change their future by assessing the quality of education for ECA they need and deserve. Please do not close. I think with this uh, beginning of time and every time we come into a halt, uh, it's uh, affecting our children. I'm a mother of, of four children, which essentially lost the opportunity to attend to this, uh, to ECA due to the fact that we have been uh, going back and forth and, and hey. uh, being able to open ECA on time. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Hello? Go ahead, caller. Uh, um, thank you. My name is Eliana Howe, and I'm one of the special ed teachers at the school that has been supporting ECA for many years, and I just would like to have the school continue helping the students in the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Ruth Posey. I'm a parent in the community. I would like to say that I support the school, um, the teachers, the staff, and the families, most importantly. Um, I think the school is very good for the community because of the excellent instructional program and, and care for the students and family. And I think it would be unfair to interrupt the instruction for the students, the children, and the families who are gone this far into the school year and who are really thriving and learning. Um, with the connection the classmates and the teachers, it seems like it's a very great program, and I wish you would give it another chance to stay open. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Caller, and with a number ending in one six. I would just like to say that I support. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think that it should be given the uh, chance to finish out the school year. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. You have one minute. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Uzo Maduski. I'm just pleading that you consider leaving ECA to thrive. Please do not close down the school. Thank you. Thank you. N Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Hi, I'm um, in support of Eagle Collegiate Academy continuing. I have two children that will be attending Eagle Collegiate Academy in the fall, and I'm looking forward to being able to make that choice to which school I want to send my children. So I just ask that you would continue to help ECA and support ECA and keep the school open. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. You have one minute. Hi, my name is Jolie. I have two kids in ECA, and I'm here to support the school. I would like you guys to give us the opportunity to stay open. Uh, my kids are so happy with this school. The teachers are so great. Uh, the directors, everybody, we are so happy, and we ask you guys to leave that school open. It's going to be a great impact, not just for Santa Clarita, but for the areas I would do say, and I know it's going to be great. We're going to do amazing if you, guys, if you guys give us a chance to stay open. My kids, want, they have been learning so much. 
they have been developing themselves so much, and I'm so happy with this school. Please give us the opportunity to stay open, and I know you guys are not gonna just gonna be happy with this this school. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Hello. Hi. My name is Ezekiel Mokoye. I am, I am a father of two. My, I will pray not to be close the ETA class, uh, school because my kids are doing better. Like, hey, guys, say something. Don't be close your school. Please not, don't close our school. We really need it. Our class is the best. Easy. Don't close our school. We need it. Because if we don't pass it, we won't be able to do school. Or learn. Are you finished with your public comment? Is there... Please go to school. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. This is Elizabeth Chislett, and I'm calling as a community member. Our community really needs a school like Eagle Collegiate Academy. The students are very happy learning there, and they would be devastated if the school closes. Please allow the school to remain open so their education is not disrupted. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your time starts now. Caller, are you? Hi, my name is Isabella, and I'm a potential parent at Eagle Collegiate Academy. I see the value that Eagle Collegiate Academy has through its educators, its teachers, its staff, and I am so, so, so excited for my children to be a part of this, their instructional program, such as their International Baccalaureate and Primary Years Program candidacy. I believe in a strong mission, and I do not want the school to be closed down to, for my children not to have the experience that the current students are having. Our the staff, the teachers are so wonderful that from what I've heard and seen, and it's just we really want the school to stay open so that our children and more children can experience what our children are experiencing now. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Hi, my name is... Kristen, and I support ECA. Go ahead, caller. The school has a great education program, and it is good for the community, especially for the students. It would be bad and such a shame to close the school down, especially in the middle of the school year. Please do not shut down Eagle Collegiate Academy. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Hi, my name is Mobology. I am a parent of a third grader um, at ECA, and I have two potential um, children coming in in the fall. Please um, help us keep ECA open for the betterment of these young kids and also to avoid disruption of the educational um, learning that is already going. My daughter is very happy with her um, teacher, and she has already made a strong bond with her um, classmates. ECA, from what I've observed, has come with total hard work, rigorous cu curriculum, and great determination to make sure that the students succeed. Please help us keep the school open. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Hi, my name is Anna Morales. I'm a parent of a third grader, my son, Andrew, and I'm in support of Eagle Collegiate Academy to stay open. I, my son comes from a background of homeschooling. It took me a long time to find a good fit for my son, and in Eagle Collegiate Academy, he has been um, just learning, being successful. He has grown leaps and grants in many ways, 
I'm very excited and happy for him to continue on. So please, please keep this school open because it will de be a detriment to my son. And he's my son, Andrew. Thank you. My I apologize. I think I. My name is Andrew, and I really like this school. My teacher, Miss Cristel, and my um my classmates they bring really good um uh, education, and it involves the fun too. My name is Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Hi. Uh, my name is Oge. And uh, I'm a parent. I would like to appeal to you to keep ECA open. It has an excellent, excellent program for the students and the teachers, everybody, the kids are so happy to be there. The parents are happy and they are giving them excellent education. The program is wonderful. It will be a tragedy if you close this school. Keep it open and see what they can do. Give them the opportunity to show you that it's an excellent, excellent, um, for emphasis, I repeat, excellent, excellent program that they have. So keep it open. You can hear everybody. It is imperative that you keep it open. I appeal to you to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Good afternoon, caller. Are you there? Uh, you are live. Please start your public comment. Oh, I'm sorry. I did already. That's okay. Go ahead. Oh, you already made a public comment? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Hello, my name is uh, Uche Madiske. I happen to be one of the parents of the students that goes to um, ECA. I want to passionately, passionately plead that you leave this school open. My daughters have been having a wonderful, one-of-a-kind experience going in there. They come back every time and they tell me how they have been taught uh, different languages, South Korean and all of that. So the opportunity for them to be multilingual actually exists by them going to this school. So I'll plead with you that you please leave the school open. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Caller with the number ending in two or, I'm sorry, 4048. Please start your public comment now. No, I just, uh, oh. I just believe as my comment. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much, sir. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. Uh, you have one minute. Your time starts now. Hello, my name is David, and I love this school and my teacher mates and I hope you um, open this school so I can go to school the next grade. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Oh, and it looks like that concludes public comment for item number five. Thanks to all of the people who commented. We appreciate you uh, showing up and giving us your input. Uh, and now uh, we need to find out if we have some more discussion on the board. Any questions? Yes, Member Bananka. Um, so I have a clarifying question. It seems like many of the issues stem from the difference between um, the predicted enrollment and the actual enrollment. And so I'm just curious, um, 
how was ECA able to predict the enrollment of 131 students? And was that prediction corroborated by any evidence or was it checked by any state agency before it was approved? Uh, so um, maybe we wanna go first to Stephanie McFarland on your second part of your question, and then we can go to uh, Dr. Okoye Johnson. So I might bring in our fiscal services division. I know Kiyomi Meeker is, is on the line um, to help answer any fiscal questions. But yes, they're, the way that new and, and expanding charters are funded is that they, they uh, um, estimate how many students that they are going to receive. So they estimated 168 students, I believe, on their PENSEC report, and that is what they were funded for. A 20-day report comes out, um, and we received that at the beginning of November, I think November 1st, which indicated they had 12. Um, so there is a little bit of a time lapse um, between finding how much they were funded and, and how many they actually had. Um, so there is, you know, that that's sort of the, the, the verification is that 20-day report of how many students they have. And I'm sure, Kiyomi, if you're on the line, you could probably answer that more elegantly than I could. Um, but if you feel we like see that, me. You, you did a good job, Stephanie. Um, then, and just for background for the board meeting, uh, board members, uh, hi, Kiyomi Meeker, um, education, um, fiscal administrator in the school fiscal services division. This is how we fund all new charters, um, because the advanced funding is based, um, for all LEAs on prior year ADA and new charters don't have that. We have something called the special advance. And so the first one is an estimate. Um, they do their best guess based on enrollment. And then the first time we get um, real data um, or based on actual numbers is the 20 day. And so that's where we saw the discrepancy. I think that answers your question. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes, member Glover Woods. First, I'd like to thank all of the students and the parents and the staff members from Eagle Collegiate Academy that called in. It's just quite unfortunate that we are even at a place to have this discussion this afternoon. It's such a challenge to open a new school and opening a new school in the midst of a pandemic makes it even more challenging. Um, with that being said, uh, this grave concern that I have is regarding the fiscal insolvency. The numbers that have been shared uh, based on CDE's projections and even uh, Eagle Collegiate Academy's projections just show that um, there is a gross fiscal insolvency for the school and the ability for them to continue to operate with uh, such a deficit is, um, it, it makes it very challenging to do so um, at a minimum. So I, um, again, just want to say to the communities and to my fellow board members, this is a, a challenging and difficult decision to be made. Um, and I, I will be ready to make a motion when it is time to do so. Are there any other questions or comments from board members? Seeing none, um, I think we are ready for a motion. Vice President Glover Woods. Thank you, President Darling Hammond. Um, I move that we, I move that we um, issue a notice of intent to revoke with notice of facts um, pursuant to Education Code Section 47607H. Um, at this time. Uh, is there a second? Second that. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, Brooks, can you please call the roll call vote? Member Rodriguez. Yes. Member Patillo Brownson. Yes. Member McQuillan. Yes. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Yes. Member Olkin. Member Lewis. Yes. Vice President Glover Woods. Yes. 
Member Escobedo. Yes. President Darlene Hammond. Yes. Member Banaka. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Dr. Ogoikoya Johnson for um, her work on this charter and the uh, work of the uh, um, staff who called in and the students. Uh, we uh, feel the pain that you experienced. We also want to thank uh, Stephanie Farland and the members of our CDE staff who have been doing extensive due diligence on this question for quite some time, and we appreciate their efforts very much. Uh, and with that, we're going to take a 10 minute break. I'd like to ask board members to please just turn off your microphones and cameras uh, and do not leave the meeting. And we will see you at uh, 2.55. We'll give you 11 minutes. Thank you. All right, welcome back. Uh, board members, we need to reestablish a quorum, so Brooks is going to call the roll. Member Rodriguez. Present. Member Patilla Brownson. Present. Member McQuillan. Here. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Here. Member Olkin. Member Lewis. Present. Vice President Glover Woods. Here. Member Escobedo. Here. President Darlene Hammond. Here. Member Banaka. Here. We'll have a quorum. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we're moving to item six. Uh, item six is the approval of modifications to California's 2020 to 2023 Unified Strategic Workforce Development Plan. And the CDE recommends that we approve the modified state plan under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act of 2014. This item will be presented by Tim Rainey. Executive Director of the California Workforce Development Board, and Carolyn Zachary, the Administrator of the Adult Education Office of the State Department, with an introduction by Pete Callis, who is Director of the College and Career Division of the CDE. Pete, Tim, and Carolyn, uh, please begin. Good afternoon, President Darlene Hammond, State Board Members, Superintendent Thurman, and Chief Deputy Nicely. I'm Pete Callis, the Division Director over the Career and College Transition Division. Uh, my team, small but mighty, Tim Rainey um, and Carolyn Zachary are here to present on this item. I'd like to introduce Carolyn Zachary, our administrator over the Adult Education Office, and Tim Rainey, the executive director of the California Workforce Development Board, to take you through our item. Thank you. All right, I'm going to start sharing my screen first. I'm hoping you can all see that. And here we go. All right. Well, good afternoon, Superintendent Thurman, President Darling Hammond, and Vice President Grover Woods. We will be presenting information and seeking approval today for the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act State Plan Modification. The acronym for the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act is WIOA. As background, the first California state plan was approved by the state board in January 2016 with mid-plan modifications approved in 2018. The current state plan was approved by the state board in 2020 and today we were bringing forward the mid-plan modifications. Tim Rainey, the executive director of the California Workforce Development Board will provide information on the state plan. I will follow with information about our adult education, Title II Adult Education and Family, Family Literacy Act section. Tim? Thank you, Carolyn. Um, honored to be here, uh, President Hammond. Thank you very much. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, Superintendent Thurman for being a member of the State Workforce Development Board and Pete Callis for um, uh, participating so much in the State Board's work and uh, my friend Pat and colleague Patricia DeCoss is on and, and of course my, my good friend and colleague Carolyn Zachary for all, all your support uh, and, and work with us. Great partnership, us and, and y'all. Um, I'll, I'll go through some basic background uh, if I could and, and I should apologize in advance. I know you've been at it all day. 
uh, and here I am, another talking head, uh, so I don't bore you to tears. Uh, I don't have any uh, presentation material, so it, um, that's on me. Sorry about that. Um, so I'll just I'll talk for a bit, and and I'll I'll hand it back to Carolyn um, to to talk about the CD part. Um, quickly on the background, uh, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, uh, as Carolyn said, requires that every four years uh, the state workforce development board, every state has to do this um, with its WIOA title partners. Um, we have to publish a unified strategic workforce development plan, AKA what we call the, the state plan. Um, we also do a mandatory modification every two years. And that's in fact what this is, it's a modification. Uh, and then next year we're gonna dive into with, with your help and partnership in developing a brand new state strategic plan. So what I'm talking about now is, is, uh, is, is the modification. Um, the federally approved plan has to include all of those, uh, we have a titles, title one, adult dislocated worker and youth funding uh, that as, as you know, is administered through 45 local workforce boards around the state of California, um, title two that you're uh, more than aware of, uh, title three, Wagner Prizer Employment Service Program that's administered through the Employment Development Department. And then finally, uh, title four, that's vocational rehabilitation that's administered through the Department of, of Rehabilitation. Uh, so as our, our current, I think Carolyn might have already said this, but our current plan is gonna run to, to July, 2023. And at that point, we'll, we'll start the process of, of rewriting uh, a new state plan. Um, the uh, plan modification that we're talking about today uh, has to be to the US Department of Labor by uh, March 15th. So I, I really deeply appreciate the, the recommendation to approve um, this draft. Uh, we just got it back from uh, 30 days of public comment. We've incorporated uh, all of that comment uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're pretty close to, to ready to finalize and, and do that submittal. Um, the uh, Dress, the, the modification is unfortunately not unlike what I've presented to you before. Uh, so I, I guess, again, I'm apologizing for going over some of the same ground. Um, if you're like me though, you forgot what I said. Um, so it's gonna be all new uh, and you'll validate everything my kids say to me, uh, which will be good. Uh, the, the state plan is built on uh, three policy objectives and on seven strategies. The uh, there's also a, a vision uh, that is the underpinning of the state plan that we call High Road. And I wanna come back to that right at the end. Uh, the, the three state plan uh, objectives, the policy objectives are fostering demand-driven skills attainment. Uh, and that means aligning workforce and education programs with industry sectors so that employers have the skilled workers they need. Uh, and secondly, enabling upward mobility for all Californians. Uh, and that means making workforce and education programs easily accessible and navigable uh, especially for workers with barriers to employment and pr prioritizing investments in skills that lead to quality jobs uh, and economic security. Uh, and then finally, the last policy objective, aligning, coordinating, and integrating programs and services across systems so that we economize our limited resources for scale and impact. Um, and using this, this, this unified plan, the state plan is, is a very important way of getting at that. Uh, the seven state plan strategies, and I'll be very quick. Um, sector strategies is number one. Uh, we, we really emphasize this because this is a way to connect programs around the state to pathways uh, into good jobs that are driving regional employment. Uh, that's really important to the overall um, uh, vision and strategy of the, of the state plan. Career pathways um, is the second. Regional partnerships. We, we always say that programs should be delivered locally closest to the communities uh, and people who most need support. Um, but industry sectors don't organize within uh, political jurisdictions or school jurisdictions. Um, they organize regionally. So we need to tie into sectors, again, that are driving regional employment and that offer the best jobs and, and careers. And that work benefits both the industries uh, that we're, we're trying to help be more competitive, but also the communities that we aim to impact. Um, the fourth one is earn and learn. Combining quality applied learning with compensation is kind of the general um, uh, definition of that. But as you know, the governor uh, has has really prioritized uh, formalized apprenticeship in California, not just in the construction trades, but in uh, industry sectors beyond the trades. And there's a great deal of work going on uh, around that. Um, supportive services is the fifth. People can't afford uh, the time uh, to pursue quality skills training uh, without supports, childcare, transportation, counseling, mentoring, uh, housing income supports are all very important to make that possible. Um, the next one, number six, is creating cross-system data capacity. 
um, such as our current partnership uh, with CDE on our Cal skills, which is uh, using cross-system performance data to assess the value of different interventions, workforce interventions. We just did an impact analysis of this incredible data uh, with the California Policy Lab that we'd love to come back and share with you. Uh, and then finally, integrated service delivery. So through this coordination, data system alignment, co-enrollment, uh, making a, a complex patchwork of local programs much more navigable, as I said before, uh, for both workers and employers. We did spend uh, a lot of time last year working uh, with, with, uh, with your staff, uh, reaffirming uh, areas of focus uh, that went into, the, into this uh, modification of our state plan. Um, one is integrate around integrated service delivery and leveraging supportive services. Using co-enrollment among the WIOA titles uh, is a big part of that. Uh, uh, also a common intake process and aligned data collection and analysis is, is that's especially critical uh, for program and system alignment. And again, getting to that navigability of the, of the system so it's not such a patch, patchwork and, and difficult for people who don't have time to be messing around with, with a, a, a siloed uh, system of workforce and economic services uh, and in education services. Um, and we'll be participating in the technical assistance. Uh, it's a, actually a, a work group for co-enrollment uh, that we're engaged in with, with, uh, with California De uh, Department of Education, CDE, um, uh, providing technical assistance to the field is a big piece of that. Uh, also uh, educating local partners on the value and available resources of the Education Options Office, um, critical uh, resources and support. Uh, and then finally, for uh, Perkins, recommitting to uh, greater regional coordination in integrated service delivery. So utilizing the local and regional planning efforts, for example, um, among workforce boards, strong workforce program uh, in Perkins 5 uh, to achieve that deeper system alignment. Uh, and we will be supporting the state plan uh, for career and technical education efforts uh, under the California Workforce Pathways Joint advisory committee um, that is the, the the plan in a nutshell and if i could i'd like to go back to the vision that's underpinning all of this work because i think it's important it, it's it's uh, over the last couple of years is where we've really kind of refined our, our our approach uh to workforce development and how we get to that kind of system change that could impact equity in, in the state um it, it this is i think the california workforce development boards and the state plans and our partners uh real contribution to uh, getting at the governor's vision of a, a California for all. Um, I, th I think, uh, and I can say this because I've been part of the workforce system for a long time, uh, too long. Uh, well, I shouldn't say too long. We have a lot of work to do. Um, the traditional workforce approach uh, is, is inadequate on its own for addressing poverty and inequality uh, in California. Um, we keep trying to push people into labor markets and hope they get jobs. Um, President Obama uh, used to call that train of price, one of my favorite lines that I think it really sort of describes the challenge that we have. We can't just expect that people are gonna attach. We have to make those, uh, those connections happen. Um, we get a lot right as a workforce development system, especially serving people that most need a leg up in competitive labor markets. Um, but I think we get one important thing wrong. Uh, rather than responding to labor markets, um, we need to be in the business of shaping labor markets. Um, otherwise, we're not going to move the needle on economic equity. Uh, a structural problem uh, that we have to contend with is uh, that there aren't enough good jobs for the number of people who need good jobs. Uh, MIT economist David Otter, uh, who recently came out with a, with a wonderful book, I wish I had the title in front of me, I tell you, um, Google him. Um, he likens this challenge of, of too few good jobs to a basketball game in a high school gym where you've got a fixed number of seats. Uh, and you've got more spectators showing up for the game than there are seats and everybody wants to sit down. Um, and the seats will go to those who are quick and aggressive in sitting down. Um, and we can train people to be faster. We can train people to be more, more aggressive for the next game. But the fact is, you still have the same number of fixed seats. Um, so as a workforce system, if we don't change the way we approach workforce development uh, from that traditional approach, then we're going to continue to feed this competition for too few good jobs and who loses out in that competition are communities that have been historically marginalized. So to, to move the needle uh, on economic equity, to get to that California for all, 
Um, we can't just respond to labor markets. I said we have to be in the business of shaping them. And to us, that means uh, at least three things. Um, one is improving access to good jobs built into uh, the objectives built uh, that, that are uh, described in the state strategic plan. Improving access to, to good jobs means connecting exist existing workforce programs to not just any jobs, but the best jobs in industry sectors with projected growth and openings. So being very deliberate about not just we'll respond to, to markets, but we're looking at what the trends are in terms of where the, the openings are over the next five years, but we're also paying a lot of attention to job quality. Um, the second one is creating more good jobs. So we could use our public dollars, the people's money, uh, to subsidize high road employers um, and help them be more competitive and grow. Um, rather than subsidizing the low road, companies that offer high turnover, low wage jobs um, and that are dangerous in, in many cases. And the third one is improving existing jobs. So we can work and we're doing this all over California, as a matter of fact, um, working with employers that are interested in job quality as a way to improve recruit recruitment and uh, the retention of talent. So I'll, I'll finish up with uh, kind of hitting the three high road principles of equity, job quality and climate. Uh, that's the, the approach uh, that we're taking with High Road and applying it not just to workforce programs, but also to policy in Sacramento. Um, job quality is starting with quality jobs in sectors, again, that are driving regional employment. And a good job uh, is, is, has been defined in, in many places, um, but I think it's worth saying safe and just workplace, uh, living wages, family health benefits, retirement and pension cont contributions if possible investment and training and job mobility, worker voice and agency on the job, and fair and predictable scheduling are just a few uh, of those kinds of components that make up a good quality job. Um, we can focus on those as a workforce system and attaching the people that we want to impact to those. We can't achieve equity if we don't pay attention to job quality. Uh, and then equity is uh, workforce programs uh, that I think are doing really good in this, on this score uh, on f and focusing uh, on populations that have significant barriers to employment. The trick is to make sure that we're not thinking that any job is a good job and kind of erasing that from the workforce culture uh, and focusing on uh, the best quality jobs and making sure we're getting people pathways to those jobs. Um, and then finally, climate, focusing on building resiliency for industries and workers and communities that are most impacted by climate. Um, our end game is uh, to increase economic equity by transforming the way whole industry sectors recruit, hire, promote, and retain talent. I think we can do that. In fact, we are doing it. Um, so we end up with a California economy that's defined by quality jobs, it's defined by equity, and defined by climate uh, resilience. Uh, so this is long game stuff. I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tim. I always appreciate the hearing from you and your enthusiasm. And I hope that I can um, mirror that enthusiasm for our Title II programs that I'm going to share about now. So I'd first like to, I'm going to jump through a couple slides because Tim talked about the totality of the WIOA programs. And those include Title I, which is the Dislocated Worker Adult, Dislocated Worker Adult Program and Youth Program. He also talked about Title III, Wagner Pizer, and Title IV, which is a vocational rehabilitation program. So he touched on those, but I really want to dive deeper into adult education and the Adult Education and Family Literacy Act, which is Title II of WIOA. And I first want to start with just one or two sentences about the history of adult education in California. We've been working for well over 150 years in California to help adults move their families forward on a solid economic path. Back in 1856, the, the San Francisco Board of Education opened night programs for immigrants to help them learn English, and at that time, vocational skills. And so, we have a solid footing in California in adult education and are probably one of the oldest states to offer adult education from um, such a long time ago. Title II, as you'll see, focuses on helping adults become literate, whether it's in English or just in general, 
literacy to become economically self-sufficient. We also have the focus on family literacy, where we're helping parents improve their skills to then also help their children improve their skills in school. That's the family literacy component. We're also looking at how we can help adults attain their secondary school diploma, whether that's through a high school diploma program or through um, an equivalency program such as, such as GED or HiSET. We have a large focus on our immigrant population, and as you'll see a little later, our immigrants and our students who speak a language other than English make up the majority of the, of the individuals that we serve. In order to be served in adult education, you have to be 18 years of age or older, and you do not need to have a social security number. You don't have to have a right to, any right to work documentation. This is um, a little different than some of the other title programs, although we are working very hard, as Tim has talked about, to ensure equity. So we're striving to find as many services with our title partners, so we call title one, three, and four, to ensure that everyone can receive services. The um, students that come to us, as uh, Tim talked about, often have some barriers. And it could be that they have limited English, limited education, they may be in a low income job and wanna improve their skills. They may be coming to us with some disabilities or they may have some limited career skills and they want to improve those career skills. Tim also talked about co-enrollment. We've been working on co-enrollment in California for several years and feel that we're making great strides in co-enrollment. Co-enrollment is where students who are in adult education are also being served at our America's Job Centers for California, or they're being served at the Department of Rehabilitation. And the idea is that they can help improve their English skills, they can earn that diploma or their equivalency, and most importantly, we can help them to upskill into um, better to good jobs, as we're calling them. But we know that adults um, also in co-enrollment can learn these new career skills. If they need to reskill to move into a new career, they want to enter or re-enter the workforce. They again want to improve their reading or their math. And also a big focus of our adult education programs is preparing students for citizenship. I wanted to provide an overview of funding for adult education in California because WIO is, WIOA is not our only source. We have um, programs that receive LCFF funding, the local control funding formula. If they're sitting in a community college non-credit program, they're receiving apportionment. And many of our programs also, especially our community-based, faith-based organizations, uh, receive donations, and our library literacy programs are supported by state library funds. The bulk of the dollars, though, that support adult education in California come through the state from the adult education program called CAPE. And we receive over $560 million in that uh, fund source to support adult learning throughout the state. And then our WIOA Title II fund is around $107 million this last year. Where would you find adult programs? Where, where are they located? They're situated in K-12 schools or K-adult schools, so associated with the school district. They're in community college, non-credit programs, community faith-based organizations, libraries, we even have some uh, workforce development boards that are offering Title II programs and corrections is another big area of focus. These are the program areas that you will find students learning in our programs, adult basic and secondary education, programs for immigrants, including civics education, citizenship and ESL, family literacy, integrated education and training, this is where we are increasing our partnerships 
with our local workforce development boards and the high road training programs that in partnerships that Tim talked about, workforce entry and re-entry, adults with disabilities, pre-apprenticeships and short-term career, career technical education. Those three have asterisks because those programs cannot be supported with WIOA funds and they're only supported with our state funds. Now COVID certainly had an impact and that was part of the information that was included in our state plan modifications is how we reacted to COVID throughout the state. But as you can see, we have seen declining, declining enrollment. I will say though, that this year when we compare the first six months to last year's first six months, we are seeing a great uptick in enrollment in our programs. This slide just gives you a general overview of enrollment across the various programs in the state. There's a difference between students that are enrolled, reportable individuals and participants. And so uh, when we're looking at our participants, those are students that have been enrolled in um, our programs for 12 or more hours of instruction and have a pre-test and a post-test. So they've been in the program long enough and had enough hours to be pre and post tested. What do our students look like? We have over 60% of our students are Hispanic or Latino, 16% uh, Asian, 12 white, um, and around 6% are um, African American. Nearly 50% of our students are between the ages of 24, 25 and 44. And then our next largest demographic Really, we're kind of equal there between the 19 and 24 year olds and the uh, 45 and 54 year olds. Right now, what's happening in many of our programs is uh, we have all three types of instruction happening. We have online, online instruction, in-person instruction, as well as hybrid instruction. And instruction happens in adult education all the time. It can happen on a 24 hour cycle with our online instruction. And many of our programs found that they had increases in students through the online programs, uh, logging on at 10 o'clock at night at one in the morning because they were able to work that into their work schedule. And that is truly a benefit of our programs. So in closing, I would just like to ask that the Board of Education approve the modifications to our state plan. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, uh, very inspiring. Um, we wanna put the public comment slide up so that people can queue up for public comment by calling the number and dialing the access code listed there. And before we go to public comment, um, I would like to uh, see if our liaisons, Member Mel McQuillan and Rodriguez, would like to offer some comments. Uh, Member McQuillan. I just want to thank the staff for their great presentation. It's such an important program to helping some of our most vulnerable uh, community members who are trying to become more employable and um, get literacy skills and you know, in some of our places that we really need to help people out in those vulnerable places, whether it be incarceration, uh, our community centers and libraries and other locations. So such an important program. So thank you for the presentation. Member Rodriguez. Um, I'd like to echo my fellow members comments. Um, I think that uh, both uh, Mr. Tim Rainey and Carolyn Zachary did a wonderful job of overviewing this uh, particular, giving all of the nuts and bolts. And so as a liaison, um, I will stick with the impact. Um, I actually started in adult education. I started my career in teaching and uh, in a community like mine, which is uh, so impoverished uh, and we have so many uh, recent immigrants, I've noticed that adult education is a program that helps uh, people gain confidence, parents 
teach their children how to read. Um, sorry about that little cough in the background. My dog has a tracheal collapse. Oh, uh, and yes, so, uh, but you know, there are so many opportunities, adults who need diplomas for their, uh, to, to move, move up in their jobs, moms learning English so that they can support their families. Um, and then additionally, which is another item that we'll see tomorrow, but the CT opportunities for the adults uh, where they can venture down new career pathways. And that's where uh, watching the parents become empowered, uh, you know, it, it trickles into the family, especially the adult literacy, right? You know, when there's family literacy programs. Thank you. Very, very helpful. Uh, do we have any public comment? We do, there is one caller in the queue. I will open up the phone line now. Good afternoon, caller. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. You have one minute. Your time starts now. Hi, this is Hayen Kimner with the California Community Schools Learning Exchange. Uh, we're thrilled to hear this update that reflects your commitment to cultivating and a strengthening alignment and partnerships in support of a holistic approach to equitable learning, innovation, and improvement, and capacity building. This particular use of the federal WIAO to support family and adult literacy is an important facet to an LEA's community school strategy if done intentionally to integrate and align efforts, communities, partners, and staff. Not only is this about engaging adults and families, but connecting it to support K-12 literacy, higher ed and workforce partners, and other municipal partners is the work of community schools in action. And these important community schools' muscles of partnership are integral to maximizing all of our state and federal investments in transformation. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that concludes public comment for item number six. Thank you. And that was a wonderful um, uh, connecting of the dots uh, between our community schools initiatives and uh, many of the adult education initiatives and workforce initiatives that uh, really do make a big difference in that context. So I now want to just ask the board members if there's any uh, discussion or questions or comments on the item. Yes, Member McCullen. So did I, uh, just clarification uh, going forward, this is a modification at the two year junction and then next year we'll be diving in further to uh, modify the plan or create a whole new plan. Is that what I heard? Thank you. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right. Uh, Member McCullen, your hand is still up. Is that another comment or are you ready to make a motion? I'm ready to make the motion to All right, uh, adopt the plan with the modifications. As stated. Uh, do I have a second? Second it. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and is there any further discussion? All right. Uh, is there any further discussion? I, I just wanted to appreciate the call out on family literacy and the lifting up of the two generation approach, which I, I think is such an important through line to all of our K to 12 schools, but also just making sure that it, it is um, it hasn't always, I think, been lifted up, and I appreciate that you all are doing that. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Seeing no more discussion, um, Brooks, uh, please call the roll for the vote. Member Rodriguez. Yes. Member Patillo Brownson. Yes. Member McQuillan. Yes. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Yes. Member Olkin. Member Lewis. Yes. Vice President Glover Woods. Yes. Member Escobedo. Yes. President Darlin Hammond. Yes. Member Banaka. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Um, terrific. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, as I said, very inspiring. And um, we can move on now to our last items which are the consent agenda um and uh the uh, regular consent items are items eight through ten 
We do want to open up the phone line again for a public comment uh, on those consent items. Members of the public wishing to provide comment may do so by calling the telephone number and using the access code provided on the slide that is showing now. And we'll give it a little bit of wait time just in case uh, people are trying to queue up for comment. Give it a few more seconds before we check in. Do we have anyone queuing up for public comment? There is no one signed up for public comment. All right. Uh, so given that there is no public comment, I'll ask for a motion on consent for items eight through 10. Do I have a motion? So move. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now hold a roll call vote. Brooks, please call the roll. Member Rodriguez. Yes. Member Patillo Brownson. Yes. Member McQuillan. Yes. Member Orozco Gonzalez. Yes. Member Olkin. Member Lewis. Yes. Vice President Glover Woods. Yes. Member Escobedo. Yes. President Darlin Hammond. Yes. Member Banaka. Aye. Motion carries. All right. I want to applaud uh, the expeditiousness of all of us and our colleagues at the State Department of Education. We have made it through day one uh, of our board meeting. And so uh, grab, the, grab that extra time, go get a walk or a, a latte or whatever strikes your fancy. We will see you tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. Thank you.